Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Prohor Mitra, uh, who is basically a, a new postdoc at DMTP Cambridge University and just moved from IAS Princeton. And uh, this is his second postdoc. IAS, he did the first postdoc and he's, he did his uh, PhD from Harvard University with Andrew Storminger. His expertise area is quantum field theory, string theory, and uh, quantum gravity. Uh, he will talk about covariant phase space for non abelian gauge theories and soft factorization. And this is basically the 49th QASTM seminar. And uh, thank you, Prohor, for accepting uh, the invitation and uh, giving this lecture for all of us. And it, it is very uh, like, it means a lot for us. And uh, we all are welcoming you from Potsdam. Uh, you can start. Okay. Thank you, Shantan. Yes, so I want, I did, uh, so thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to give a virtual talk, which is the best you can do these days. Um, so before I begin, I did wanted to say that I really enjoyed these seminar series. You know, one thing that's great about, I mean, there's not much that's great about COVID-19, but one thing that's great about it is that we now have the opportunity to go and attend talks all around the world. So I've been attending a bunch of uh, uh, talks from uh, QASTM, uh, and I've really enjoyed uh, a lot. I mean, every one of them that I've attended. So I think it's a great series and I hope it continues on. Okay, so with that, uh, okay, so this is the new logo, which I was told to add here. And so if you don't already know that, that's the new logo for QASTM. Okay, so with all of that, let me just begin. So I'm going to talk about covariant phase space for non-abelian gauge theories and soft factorization. Uh, so let's explain what exactly I'll be doing in this talk. So we'll explore uh, this idea here of the covariant phase space formalism. And this is essentially what I'll talk most about in this talk. If nothing else, what I want you to understand from this is what is the covariant phase space formalism? How do you apply it in various different theories and what is its usefulness? So that's really what I want you to get out of it. I've been told that I have about two hours to, to give a talk. So you know, two hours is a good time to give a strong lecture on like to introduce a topic uh, uh, nicely. So that's what I'm hoping to do. I'll go into some detail and explain everything uh, as much as possible. And then what I'll do in this uh, roughly the second half, much shorter half, not a half, most likely the last quarter, uh, I'll apply this covariant phase space formalism and we'll learn something uh, in this other secondary area of asymptotic symmetries and flat space times. So the covariant phase space formalism, I think, was studied by a lot of people, Krinkovich, Witten, uh, Iyer Wald, Iyer Lee, Wald Zupas. So there's a lot of interesting papers in the past. Asymptotic symmetries sort of, I think, were first studied by BMS in the 60s, but perhaps more interestingly and more recently by Strominger, where they, he studied it and related it to soft theorems. That's also where I learned it. Okay, so the goal of today's talk will be to canonically quantize non-abelian gate theories in four-dimensional flat space time. So this seems like a very simple thing to do because it's probably one of the first things you learn how to do in QFT1. Uh, but we'll see that I'm going to try and do it in a slightly different way, and that's going to allow, uh, force me to introduce some new technology, which I'll do. And then once I've done the canonical quantization, I'm going to derive a Ward identity for large gauge symmetries, tr these transformations of symmetries, and we'll see that it, it, from there you get uh, soft theorems. And everything that I'm going to say today, and much more, in much more detail than what I'm going to say today, is in this paper, uh, which came out, I think, just two weeks ago with Temple Her, who is a postdoc at uh, UC Davis. Okay, so I just wanted to say that please feel free to ask questions at any time. Whenever you want, stop me and ask questions. You know, when you give a word so, to I just have a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, like uh, this uh, covariant phase phase formalism, is this somehow related to this uh, Andrew's uh, approach of asymptotic symmetries, BMS? Essentially, essentially it is, though he doesn't ever do it in that way. Andy, Andy doesn't do it in this particular way, but if you follow the work of Barnish, Crozart, uh, and you know, the group at Brussels, 
uh-huh. they use the covert face face formalism quite a lot oh okay 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 so my goal today is essentially to be very very careful about everything no because why and, i asked because in andrew's paper it is not i haven't seen that's why yeah I, he well it's sort of secretly there under the rug yeah. he never really you may know better than exactly. you are spe- expert on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 it's sort of there but yeah. but it's he is essentially doing the covariant phase space formalism yeah even if he doesn't make it very clear but yeah that's exactly my goal today is to sort of make it very clear i'm going to go through you know i'm going to cross all the t's dot all the i's make sure that i don't miss anything and that's sort of the whole point of this work was to really put everything on a very strong foundation and i'm going to try and be as detailed as possible in what i'm saying Thank and so because it's going to be is so detailed and perhaps there's going to be some calculation there's a chance that you might lose track so honestly feel free to stop me at any time and ask me any questions you know because i can't see your faces so i don't have any feedback on how you know whether what i'm saying is actually <laughs> that's correct <laughs> okay okay so with that said let me just straight away right tell you the results first and foremost because at the end of the day if you don't remember anything else it's fine just remember this slide and i'll be happy so what i'm going to show is that contrary to what people tell you when you study quantum field theory or the standard assumption in quantum field theory is that there is a vacuum state and it's unique the what's what i'm going to end up showing at the end of the day is that that's not true in gauge theories that cannot be true it also can't be true in gravitational theories and in particular there are infinitely many vacuum states and they all form a form a what's called a vacuum hilbert space and more than that they're infinitely but they're continuously infinite so they're uncountably infinite uh they're parameterized by a function u of zz bar this uh, zz bar over here is stereographic coordinates on the sphere and uh, this u is an element of the lie group so it's parameterized by an element of the lie group and it's a, it's it's a function on the sphere okay so it's unco- it's an entire functions worth of uh, of vacuum states and then the main thing we'll derive at the end of everything is that uh, is this formula right here So let me spend some time on this formula because as I said this is the at the end of the day this is the only thing I want you to really take take home. So I want to make sure you understand every every aspect of this formula. So um this part here is a vacuum state as I said it's parameterized by this u and this part here is another vacuum state. This quantity over here represents a scattering amplitude an n point scattering amplitude with n particles and each particle is written over here it's labeled by momenta p1 to pn and these i1s other are the indices of whatever representation they transform under the gauge group g so it could be the fundamental it could be adjoint or you know whatever representation there are so i'm not having any restrictions on what g can possibly be and or any represent, uh, restriction on the representations um and so it's an n point scattering amplitude but as i said there's no unique vacuum state so in order to define what i mean by n point scattering amplitude i have to give you an in vacuum and an out vacuum so this u prime minus represents the in vacuum and this represents the out vacuum okay so this is literally the most general s matrix that you could possibly hope to compute in a non abelian gauge theory and the claim is that if i try to compute this quantity it's related to the qft amplitude by which i mean the thing that you are all used to computing using quantum field using just feynman diagrams the things that everyone knows how to do you co- you compute this quantity over here and then the the more general amplitude is related to uh the qft amplitude by very simple factorization formula so as you can see all the uh, dependence on the vacuum states is sitting inside this product which is just a factor sitting in front so proper what is plus and minus here yeah so plus just represents out and in so oh okay okay oh. so the out vacuum and the in vacuum that's all yeah okay and so here no, notice that there's a delta u minus u prime so this tells you that unless u is equal to u prime you have a vanishing scattering amplitude 
Uh, these are ones. What are these are ones? This is the representation of G uh, for the uh, the first particle. So for the particle O one, right? Everything transforms in representations of the gauge group. So this R one is that representation. Um, now that's this is just U. Now, as I said, U is a function of Z and Z bar. So it's a function of it's a it's a function of the sphere. So what is this p hat over here? The p hat is, is essentially the direction of the momentum. So the momentum p is parameterized by the energy and a direction. The direction is a point on the sphere. And so this, the p hat one is, the, is that exact direction. Okay, and then I do this for every single particle. And then I just multiply. So these i1, j1 indices are the, again, as I, as I said before, they're the representation indices, all of these guys. And so I just multiply everything together in this way. Okay, so this is going to be, sorry, this is the form. Uh, what do you mean by the QST expectation value? <clears throat> sorry. Yes. What I mean by this quantity is the, is the thing that you compute using Feynman diagrams or whatever you compute in a standard QFT course, perhaps using path integrals or whatever non-perturbative techniques you want. So this is the standard amplitude. computed perhaps using Feynman diagrams, which is essentially the only way how we really know how to compute things. So things that you're familiar with, things that you will learn in QFT1 and QFT2, because you know, one of the, as I said, one of the assumptions that is made is that the vacuum is unique. And I'm claiming here that that's not true. In fact, as I will, well, I won't show in this particular talk, but as has become clear over lots of literature in this subject, it's precisely this assumption that is the cause of infrared divergences in gauge theories. So if you allow for infinitely many vacuum states, you can actually end up constructing an infrared finite S matrix, uh, which is a story for a different time. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, and a corollary of this. Yes, go on. I'm sorry, so uh, the Dirac delta function in the front, is that like the functional uh, Dirac delta function? So. Yeah, this is this is what's called the left invariant uh, Haar direct delta function. Okay. Uh, so because U is an element of the gauge group, what I mean by this, okay. I I, I will make this more precise. What I mean by this is that del it's a, a direct delta function which satisfies G U minus G U prime is delta U minus U prime. So it's the left invariant Haar delta function. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Okay, and the co a corollary of this is that you can derive essentially all soft theorems from this formula. It's a very simple formula, almost expected, especially if you work on this. This is something that, honestly, the formula itself doesn't surprise me. It's in fact something that I expected to get when I start with this project. So uh, that's perhaps not that big a deal, uh, but this, this very nice formula uh, essentially gives you every single soft theorem, mostly every single soft theorem that you're interested in. And the way that it does that is because of this formula, which we'll also derive. So what we'll show is that uh, if I take a gluon, so this is a gluon operator with energy E, Z, Z bar. Let's say, I, and here in this example, I've taken a plus helicity and a color A, and I multiply by E and then take E goes to zero. So that's what it means to take a soft limit. So in, in this entire talk, whenever I say soft limit, I mean this, you multiply by the energy and then take the energy goes to zero. You might be familiar, and I'm gonna talk about this before, of the Weinberg soft theorem, where the, in the leading soft limit, you get a pole, you get a one over E pole. This multiplication by E essentially is to remove that pole. Then when you take the limit, you get something nice and finite. What you can show, and we will show, is that taking this limit essentially corresponds to taking some sort of derivative of the amplitude with respect to u. Again, I'm going to be very clear about what this derivative is soon. Okay. And once you know this formula, then follows straight through because now I can just replace everything over here by the result that I have up, up there. So it's delta u minus u prime, r1 of u, dot 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 rn of u. And that's the only U dependence. And then this QFT amplitude has absolutely no U dependence. Remember that was the whole point. Everything factorizes nicely. 
And so all the U dependence is completely explicit. And once I define this derivative for you, you will know exactly how to take this derivative of all of these quantities. And then you can just evaluate this uh, uh, explicitly. And what I'll show is that when you evaluate all of these things explicitly, you end up getting the soft theorem. Okay. Okay. So that's essentially uh, what I would say the other main results. But more than that, I'd say the point of my talk is to more like introduce the covariant phase space formalism to you guys. And these will just, these results will just be a very simple corollary of that entire procedure that I'm going to go through. Okay, any question? Uh, excuse me, hi, uh, I have a small question. So yeah. uh, you consider left invariant delta function, uh, why not right invariant? Uh, they're equivalent because it's because of the way I've defined you. So uh, uh, the way I've defined you is that under gauge transformations, what happens is that, so of course I'm doing, a, I'm doing gauge theory. So everything transforms under gauge transformations in a particular way. So the way I've defined you is that under gauge transformations, U goes to G times U. So it acts on the left. Right. I mean, I could have been, in, in, instead worked with U inverse. That's totally equivalent because U and U inverse are equivalent. And then U inverse could have, would have transformed like U inverse times uh, G. So then it would have acted from the right. So this is just a matter of definition of how I define my U. I mean, I chose to work with U instead of U inverse. That's really it. Good question. But there is a certain action on from the right as well for this U. And these are all related to the interesting ideas. In particular, I can have this U sort of, uh, well, okay, this is, not, this is not important at this point. Uh, yeah, the, 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 there, there is an interesting action from the right as well, which is like holomorphic and it has precisely with the WZW actions. Okay. okay. They, they will show up when the, in, the, in the context of infra divergences. Okay, right, right. Which Thanks. is interesting. Yeah, but it's outside the scope of this talk. Okay, so those are my formulas that I'm going to uh, eventually derive after some amount of work. Okay, so what I'm going to do uh, the, in the outline, I'm going to first have a general discussion of covariant phase space, essentially motivated, so that you're you know, all on the same page as to why and why you should care. What's the point of doing that? And then I'm going to apply the entire covariant formalism to gauge theories. And uh, this is going to be the longest section because it's going to be the section with a lot of formulae, which I'm going to skip through if it's not an interesting formula. Um, but if you have any questions about how the algebra actually works, again, please stop me because I can actually go through that. And then once we get through 1B, which will indeed be like very, uh, pretty much uh, most of the talk, the rest of it will follow through very quickly. So then what I'll do is I'll do canonical quantization, which you should all be familiar with because that's one of the first things you do in, when you, in a QFT course. And then I'm going to derive a ward identity also very quick. And then from there, go on and show that how you can use that. And by ward identity, I mean this formula right here. That's what I'm going to derive in that section. Uh, and then I'm going to use that formula to derive soft theorems. And I'll end with some future prospects. Okay, good. So let's start. So what is the covariant phase space formalism? What does it do? So what it does is this very nice thing, which is that given the Lagrangian of a theory, so the, firstly, the covariant phase space formalism is a completely classical thing. There's no quantum mechanics. So there won't be any quantum mechanics until 3C where I do canonical quantization. So at this point and uh, until I tell you, everything is classical. So given a Lagrangian of a system, the covariant phase space formalism is an algorithm which tells you how to start from the Lagrangian and construct the phase space of a theory. Okay. Now, this is something is probably actually familiar to you because it's something you most likely have already done. So let's review what I'm assuming or guessing you have already done. Again, if you haven't and you have questions, please stop me. So let's take a very simple example where I have a Lagrangian, which is a function of a scalar field phi and its first derivative. There is no dependence on second or third or any higher derivatives. Okay the simplest possible Lagrangian. 
We all know the famous Euler-Lagrange equations that follow from this. Okay, so that's just the equations. So what is the phase space in this example? The phase space is quote unquote equal to, I'm gonna tell you where this coming from. Essentially the region space. What is that? It's just the space of all possible solutions of this differential equation. Now, because of the structure of the Lagrangian, this is the second order differential equation in time, right? So I just need to choose two integration constants. So the, the uh, solution space and therefore the phase space is parameterized by two numbers or two functions, any two functions. You can choose whatever you want. The most common one that you're probably familiar with is uh, on a constant time slice, I can take phi of x on that slice and phi dot of x. So this is on some constant time slice, t equal to t naught. Because this equation over here can be essentially written as phi double dot is uh, some function of phi over here. Right? Well, to be precise, it could in principle also be a function of phi dot, but anyway, it doesn't matter. It's a second order differential equation. So you just need two numbers. Okay, but that's not it. The phase space has one extra structure, which is crucial and very, very important. It's the Poisson bracket. You can also define this thing called the Poisson bracket, which is, and how do you define that? What you do is you first define the so-called canonical momentum, which you obtain by taking the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot. Uh, so this is, this is incorrect. This was from an earlier version of the, of the paper, of the, of the talk. Uh, this is not exactly equal to phi dot, it's whatever it is, because it's a Lagrangian I've assumed is totally general at this point. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not phi dot here. Okay, uh, and now you simply define the Poisson bracket as this, as this quantity here. Okay. The bracket and by which, by this I mean uh, phi with phi is zero and phi with phi is and phi with phi is a delta function. Okay, so that's it. Once you've constructed the Poisson bracket, you have the phase space. That's all you need to know. Uh, that's all you need for, to construct the phase space at the, at the level of a physicist. Mathematicians would care about topological, well, physicists would also and should care about topological features of the phase space, but they will not play a role in our part. They actually end up showing, they're very important if you want to understand West Sumino Witten terms. Um, well, West Zumino terms in WZW models, and they're also important if you want to study theta terms, theta, uh, the theta vacuum angles in QCT. Uh, so there the topology of the phase space plays a very important role, but we'll do everything locally in this, in this mode. Okay, so the question, so this is, I'm hoping everything, one, everything was familiar over here. So uh, uh, again, please stop me if you have questions. So the question now is that how do we generalize this to arbitrary space times, arbitrary Lagrangians, and arbitrary Cauchy surfaces? Let me explain what that means. So while well, arbitrary space times is, is kind of trivial, you know, maybe we want to do this in ADS, maybe we want to do this in DS or some other complicated space times. Maybe the space time itself is dynamical, so there's no good definition of T or whatever you want. Arbitrary Lagrangians, maybe you don't have a Lagrangian which is only a function of one derivative. Maybe it has 10 derivatives in it. Then how do you define canonical momenta if you have 10, 10 different derivatives? In, because if I have a 10 derivative action, then my equations of motion look like phi, let's say the 10th derivative is equal to something. But now in order for me to have a good solution, I need to prescribe phi, phi dot, phi double dot, and all of these things. All the way to the ninth derivative I need to prescribe, right? So my data, or rather my gamma has so many coordinates. It's not just phi and phi dot anymore. So then how do you define the Poisson bracket in this case? And then on top of that arbitrary Cauchy surfaces, uh, here the Cauchy surface we chose was the T equal to uh, T naught Cauchy surface. That's because we chose to work in Cartesian coordinates. But there was no need to do that. What if I work in, I don't know, Mill coordinates or Rindler coordinates or some other coordinate system in Minkowski space or some other coordinate system in an arbitrary ge generic space time. So instead of working in a constant T slice, I want to generalize this to an arbitrary, arbitrary sigma. And then I need to work out what the, all the coordinates are on this sigma. 
So essentially, literally the most general thing that you could possibly do. And the answer to that question is the covariant phase space formulas. And that's what it tells you how to do. Complete generalization in essentially all directions. Okay, so I haven't told you anything. I've just given you a name. So let's, let's go forth a little bit more with this example. We, we go a little bit more, but before we do that, let me give you a, a bit more of a formal introduction to, to uh, phase spaces, uh, essentially at the level that I'm going to need. So it'll be a little bit more of a mathematician's definition of a phase space, uh, but it's all the same. Okay, so again, before we do phase spaces, I'm going to do a lightning review of differential geometry, essentially to fix my conventions, just, just, so, just so no one is confused. So if, if M is any differential manifold, this could be a phase space, which, it's a, which is a differential manifold. It could be space time, which is a differential manifold. It's a Riemannian manifold. Uh, this, we denote the space of functions by F of M. A vector, we are going to think of as a map from functions to functions. Essentially, the vector acts like this. Okay, so it's a map from, it takes a function and gives you a new function. In fact, more than that, it's a derivative map because it satisfies the product rule. Okay, this all should be obvious. Uh, we'll think of a Q form as a totally anti-symmetric Q linear map. So it's something that takes Q vectors as an input. This T gamma is, is the tangent bundle, by the way. Sorry, this should be, this should be Tm. Tm, not gamma, that's, that's incorrect. Um, so I'm going to think of a Q form as something that takes Q vectors and returns a number. So this is just some function. Okay. And once we have those, you, these are some standard uh, act, uh, standard operations on differential forms, which again, all of this should be very uh, known to you. This first thing is the Lie bracket between two vectors, which is defined in this way. So the Lie bracket is itself a vector. So since it's a vector, it can act on functions. And this is the definition. It's sort of, this is how you define the action of a Lie bracket on a function. And again, this is in more co uh, coordinate notation if you're more familiar with coordinate notation. Okay, then this is the interior product. Uh, again, something that should be known to you. It's literally just contract plus index. Then the exterior derivative. Again, I'm not gonna say much more about this. The wedge product. Okay, and finally we have this interesting formula, but not perhaps that interesting. This is very obvious to you. So I X, remember is defined as contract the first index. So I'm just gonna contract X mu with the first index of DF mu, but DF mu is by definition simply del F mu. But remember, this is how I was defining f of x. And this is also how I was defining, if you think of it as a, in a different way, it's df as a one form, but uh, taking an input as the vector x, which is uh, like here in this, in this way over here. Okay. Yeah, so I was told that, that the talk should be at the level of master student, so and and PhD. So that's why I'm I'm trying to make sure I can make everything. Oh no, it is very please good. Me, very good, very good. Please let me know if this is too boring. Yeah, yeah, no, no boring. You go. Okay. And then then we have the Cartan homotopy formula. This is a very important and very useful formula which applies to uh, forms only. So the Lie derivative of forms has this very simple and nice uh, structure. So it's dix plus ixt. Okay, and then I'm going to assume in everything I'm going to do, as I said, I'm only going to work locally. So I'm not going to worry about topological issues and topological problems. I'm going to assume trivial topology. What that means is the Poincare lemma, which is this statement over here. This is the Poincare lemma. Is that if a form is closed, then it is necessarily exact. So this means that this is the meaning of exact. This is the meaning of closed. So this essentially tells you that all closed forms are exact. And I'm just gonna assume that that's the case. Okay, so that's it. That's all I have to say about differential geometry. Let's, let's go on. So here's my definition of a phase space. 
A phase space is a differential manifold equipped with a two form, which is called a symplectic form, which is closed and invertible. So closed again, I, as I said, just means d omega equal to zero, which therefore means that omega is d of something. That's something we call the symplectic potential. Okay. And invertible simply is, very, is a really means a very simple thing in this example, because it's a two form, right? It's omega mu nu and it's anti-symmetric. Uh, so what I mean by this, so you can think of this as a matrix. Uh, maybe let me use the notation I'm following. So you can think of this as a matrix. So what I just mean, vertible is the determinant of omega is not zero. That's all I really mean. Now, one thing should be immediately clear and obvious to you. The de uh, determinant of an odd dimensional anti-symmetric matrix is always zero. This is just a fact. Therefore, the determinant, therefore, the phase space has to be even dimensional. It cannot possibly be odd dimensional. It ha must be even dimensional. So this is something that will come up later. So I want you to remember this. Okay, so the theta is called what we call the symplectic potential. And just if you're not familiar, I'm just writing everything down in coordinate notation again, just, you know, we all see everything in the same way. Okay, let's move on to what we, another, a very, very important uh, object in uh, phase spaces is called canonical transformations. Now, when you study Riemannian manifolds with a metric, you know that a very important thing to study are the set of vectors that preserve the metric. They're called isometries. They're generated by killing vectors. Killing vectors play a huge role in physics. They're related to symmetries and a lot of interesting things come out of that. In exactly the same way on a phase space, because the only geometric structure we have is the symplectic form. We don't have a metric. We only have a symplectic form. So it follows, it, it's natural to expect that, that diffeomorphisms or vector fields which preserve the symplectic form are important for some things. And yes, they are. So they generate what's called canonical transformations. And they're also in most canonical transformations are symmetries. So in exactly the same way that, that isometries are symmetries, canonical transformations are also symmetries. Um, so uh, this formula here is very easy to derive. Because remember, the lead derivative, I gave you this formula, the lead derivative is i of xf plus i xf of d. That's what the lead derivative is, right? That's this, this formula right here, the Cartan homotopy formula. But the symplectic form is closed. So this second term vanishes, right? Sorry. And Sorry, so I uh, simply can, yes, go on. Yeah. Is that the Laplace Beltrami operator? No, the Laplace Beltrami operator, uh, let me write it here. What, so what is I, I again? I'm Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I is I is this this action right here, this okay. one. Okay. okay. It's it's this. It's just literally you take the first uh, the first index of the vector and you contract it with the. So it's something that reduces the, it reduces the 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 order of the form. So if you if you do I X acting on a Q form, then it becomes a Q minus one form. So this yeah. formula should make sense to you now this formula over here, because yeah. you act the D, which increases the form, so Q becomes Q plus one, and then you act yeah. with I of X, which again decreases it back. So lead derivative doesn't change. Uh, but this is uh, exactly what the Laplace Beltrami operator does, right? I think the Laplace Beltrami operator is D star D star plus star D star D. It's essentially D, what's called D plus delta squared. Yeah. Exactly. So it, that involves a Hodge dual and therefore involves a metric. Remember, we do not have a metric, so we cannot take oh, a Hodge okay. dual. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, we actually can take Hodge dual because there's a nice structure. We can construct a volume form. So Hodge duals don't require a metric. Well, not a metric because you have to raise and look. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, so this is just the lead derivative here. Okay, so as I was saying, so the second term vanishes because D of omega is zero. 
So therefore we have a very simple equation. D of I X F omega is zero. And again, as I've assumed all exact forms. So therefore this is a closed form, this thing inside here. And remember it's a closed form and it's a one form. That's because omega is a two form. Then I act on it with I, which gives me a one form. So this inside is one form. And because it's closed, therefore it means it must be exact. So I X of omega is equal to D of something. And this something must be a zero form. Or in other words, a function. On top of that, because omega is invertible, this is where the second property comes in to and becomes very useful. Because omega is invertible, I can write X in terms of F. And this formula defines F in terms of X. In other words, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between functions on gamma and Hamiltonian vector fields. This is perhaps why uh, if you remember something from your classical mechanics course, when you study uh, canonical uh, transformations in classical mechanics, you think of generating functions of type one, type two, there are all these amazing, uh, interesting types of various types of generating functions. The reason you can talk about canonical transformations in terms of functions instead of vector fields is because of this. That is exactly a one-to-one -one map. Okay, is everyone clear on this? Okay, so let's move on. Now we finally come to the Poisson bracket and why this is an interesting quantity to study. It's because of this very, very nice fact. Suppose F is, is the thing that corresponds to XF. So XF again is a, is a XF over here is a Hamiltonian vector field. So Lie derivative of XF of omega is zero. Lie derivative of XG of omega is zero. But if that's the case, then it must be that the lead, this uh, bracket must also be a, a Hamiltonian vector field. By the way, I didn't say what's a Hamiltonian vector. A Hamiltonian vector field is just something that, such, this XF is called a Hamiltonian vector field. That's just the name for it. But then the uh, lead bracket of these two vector fields must also be a Hamiltonian vector field. Why is that? Because the lead bracket of XG x f this vector again is by definition or well, maybe not by definition you can show that this is equal to the lie bracket with respect to minus the not bracket so the lie derivative okay this is a nice formula uh, but if i now act if i now act on both sides with omega then this is trivially zero because of, uh, because of this fact. Okay, so if XF is a Hamiltonian vector field, XG is a Hamiltonian vector field, the Lie bracket vector XG comma XF is also a Hamiltonian vector field. And therefore by this correspondence, the one-to-one -one correspondence, there must exist a function that corresponds to that vector field. That function is called the Poisson bracket. Okay, that's the definition of the Poisson bracket. And here, there's no distinction between Poisson and Dirac. You know, people make a distinction between the Poisson bracket and Dirac bracket is related to constraints. Um, and it, you know, Dirac has this amazing procedure how to construct that. We will also talk about constraints, but in this language, constraints simply really don't show up. They just end up showing up as as like equations to define subspaces inside phase spaces. So at this point, the level, it doesn't even matter whether the phase space you're talking about is a constrained phase space or is it an unconstrained phase space? None of that will matter. So I'm not making a distinction between whether this is a Poisson bracket or a Dirac bracket. Anyway, so is that clear? Do you understand why the people even are interested in studying the Poisson bracket? It's essentially that function, which is, uh, dual to under that correspondence to xg xf and if you're interested in an ex explicit formula for this which maybe you are it's given by this that's an explicit formula in other words let me write it out so that uh, perhaps you can see it fg is omega ab del af 
del B G. Right? That's the that's the formula explicitly. Again, you might be used to a different formula, and I'm that's that's my example one to explain to you why all of this is not something new. But another thing, this F actually plays another very interesting role. Uh, this F generates transformation corresponding to XF, and that's coming from this uh, this equation right here, this boxed equation. Let me box it. You see, this essentially tells you that the commutator or the the Poisson bracket of F with G generates on G the transformation corresponding to F. That's what it means, right? To generate, because that's how a vector field acts. You say generate because it's a, a vector field acts as a lead derivative. But a lead derivative on a function is simply the vector field acting on that function. So this is in fact the charge. So when people talk about charges and in Hamiltonians, for example, the Hamiltonian is the charge corresponding to uh, time, time translations. So that, that's what this means. So it's precisely under this one-to-one -one correspondence that the Hamiltonian is the function that is dual under this correspondence to the Hamiltonian vector field that generates time translations. And then I can generalize this to other isometries. So we'll be using this a lot. So if there's any confusion here, let me pause for a couple of seconds to ask if there are questions. Okay, uh, let's move on. Um, so let's just look at a quick example, just so you know, as an example that you're all probably not going to be familiar with. Uh, typically when you talk, I, I, everything I said over here was in a completely coordinate invariant form. But typically when people study phase spaces, you like to break up everything into coordinates and momenta, coordinates and conjugate momenta. So if I do that, and I write it in this form, QA is QI, PI. So there's a, the first set of variables are all coordinates and the next set of variables are all canonical momenta. Then the standard symplectic form takes this form right here. And this is called Darbo theorem. Anyway, it's some, it's some big theorem in math. It's not that hard to prove, but, uh, but this is the theorem. So it tells you that omega take this form over here. So let's, write the, let's write this out as a matrix. So what I mean over here is that omega as a matrix has the form uh, zero, zero. So of course it's an anti-symmetric matrix. So the diagonals are zero. And then over here it has identity and minus identity. Uh, here I'm thinking of this as Q, P, Q, P. Uh, remember, because omega is closed, I can define the symplectic potential theta. So theta take this, this form right here. So this might be something that's uh, perhaps familiar to you. This comes, you know, this shows up in the Summerfield quantization condition in long term. You know, this theta is very important. In fact, this theta will be the thing that we'll end up working with. Okay, and then to determine the brackets, the, the Poisson slash Dirac brackets, I need to invert omega. So I need, I need this quantity, omega inverse. That's very easy to do because this matrix is, is such a nice and simple form. Omega inverse is zero minus one, one, zero. Very simple. So again, over here, QP, QP. So if I now want to work out the commut uh, the commutator between Q and P, I just need to look at that this but this uh, this so this is Q first and then P second. So it's exactly this element here right here. So the commutator between Q and uh, sorry, I keep saying commutator that will come when I quantize. The bracket between Q and P is just the identity matrix. Okay, so this should be super familiar to you. And now the generalization to field theories is very trivial because all I have to do is replace discrete indices with, uh, with continuous indices. So everything becomes an integral. So I just have d pi wedge d, d phi, and then I'm integrating over x. Then I have uh, the same thing with theta and the brackets also look very familiar to all of you. So let me note one thing, I forgot to mention this. Everywhere over here, if you notice, I have denoted uh, 
all differential forms and operations on differential forms using a bold symbol. I, X, omega, everything is bolded. D is also bolded. Uh, that's because I want to distinguish, I'm going to use differential forms a lot. And I'm going to, I want to distinguish between differential forms on the phase space and differential forms in space time. There'll be two totally different sets of differential forms. So for different forms in space time, I'm going to use standard notation. For differential forms in phase space, I'm going to put, put everything in bold. Okay, so good. That's all the review I wanted to say, but what's the outcome? What's really the outcome of everything that I just said? In this language that I've, that I've just told you, the only thing you need to know is how to work out theta, right? Because once you have theta, you can take D of that to obtain omega. Remember omega is D of theta. And then once you have omega, you just have to invert it. And then you have the Poisson bracket, which is all you need, right? As I said, for a phase space, all you need is the Poisson bracket and the coordinates. So my goal is how, given a Lagrangian, how do I obtain theta? That's the question. That is the question that the covariant phase space formalism answers for us. Okay, that's the end of my introduction to phase space or review of phase spaces. I'm now going to go back to the original example that we studied, and I'm going to do a slight manipulation, which will make the generalization that I was interested in almost trivial. It'll be so obvious what the generalization is. Once I do the manipulation, I'm going to talk about. But before I do that, any questions on this uh, literally very brief review? Guys, if you have any question, please ask him, because he will switch into some other thing? Yeah, honestly, don't, don't, be, don't be afraid. I'm happy to answer any, any question. I didn't know most of this when I started this project. So don't worry that you, it's, none of this is trivial, not even to me. Uh, okay. I think uh, maybe Prohor, you will proceed. They will ask in between. Okay, so let's go back to the original example that we, that we looked at. And do this very simple manipulation. So I give you a Lagrangian. Remember a Lagrangian, what is a Lagrangian? It's a function of the fields. The fields or some subset of fields are coordinates on the phase space, right? So in fact, the Lagrangian itself is a function on the phase space. So L is a function on the phase space. And I can therefore, as I've, just like I mentioned before, in this, in this way right here, right here, I can act on this function with a vector. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to act on this function with a vector. This is literally, I'm just, I'm just making a nuisance of saying, take a variation of the Lagrangian. Again, I'm using this language for a very specific reason. So bear with me. All I'm really doing is taking a variation. That's really all I'm, all I'm doing. So you take a variation of the Lagrangian and this is a famous formula. Everyone knows that that's what you get. So the first term is what I'm going to refer to as the bulk term. It's essentially the equations of motion, right? These are the Euler-Lagrange equations. But the second term, something which we almost never talk about, uh, is in fact going to be essentially the crucial thing for everything we do today in our entire, entire talk is the boundary term. And therefore, uh, because the boundary term is going to be important, it's very crucial for us to have the right Lagrangian. Because if I modify the Lagrangian with boundary terms and have, don't, have, don't keep track of all of these things, I'm, I'm not going to get the right answer. Okay, so the boundary term is, well, it's just this. Again, this is something you've done in 51. But let's do this interesting manipulation. Let's integrate this boundary term. Remember, this is an object, some object with a upper mu index. So it's a, like a current. Well, it's not conserved, but it's like something with an upper mu index. Because it's an, it has an upper mu index, I can integrate it on a co-dimension one surface, right? What, I, what that means is that you take the normal vector on a co-dimension one surface, n mu, and then you integrate along that surface. So I can do that. So let's integrate it over a t equal to constant surface. And if I do that, uh, because this, when, it's t, when t is constant, this n mu over here, is essentially just n lower mu is essentially just one zero vector. 
So only the T, T component survives. But the T component is simply phi dot. And, and the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot is the canonical momentum, is pi. So it's just this quantity right here. But this quantity is the symplectic potential. Let's, uh, let's look at that right here. Theta is the integral over x of pi of x d phi of x. That's exactly what I have over here. Now it's not d, but that's because I have an x sitting in front. Remember, uh, this, is, uh, this is why I, I put in that formula over there. Uh, because if I have, if I have uh, this here, then theta, sorry, theta acting on x is integral d x. Now d phi, acting on x, but d phi acting on x is precisely x acting on phi of x. Okay, again, this is this formula right here. This is this formula right here. d of something acting on a vector is the vector acting on that something. So that's what I'm doing here. d of something is phi of x acting on x is just x. So this is theta of x. So now it's all good, right? Let's just generalize. Let's just do it all in one go. How do we generalize to arbitrary uh, uh, space time Lagrangian and Cauchy surfaces? Previously, I simply said covariant phase space formalism. Let me now just give you the exact answer. What you do is you vary the Lagrangian, you work out what the boundary term is, you integrate that boundary term over your Cauchy surface, whichever you want to integrate over, whatever that Cauchy surface may or may not be. Then you obtain theta of sigma. Once you have theta of sigma, you can construct omega of sigma, then you can invert it to construct the Poisson brackets, then you can study canonical transformations, and then everything is set. You know, you can do whatever you want with it. So that's really all it is. That's what the covariant phase space formalism is. You just work out the boundary term and integrate it. Okay, everything with me, everyone with me. So now let me formalize and I'm gonna give you the algorithm in one page. There's gonna be one caveat, which will be important. Uh, so let me, let me mention now. So now let me summarize the exact procedure of everything that we have to do. Okay, so again, in complete generality, consider a field theory on a D-dimensional Lorentzian manifold. The fundamental variables are fields, of course, and these fields are an element of this curly F, which is the field configuration space. This is essentially the set of values the field is allowed to take. So for example, if I, you know, if I'm doing string theory, then I have a target space time. The target space time is often a leak group manifold, then this F is just that leak group manifold. If it's on S1, then it's all possible values of S1. But also more than that, like if I'm doing normal quantum field theories, you have to prescribe boundary conditions for fields, right? You don't want to have solutions which blow up at infinity and therefore have infinite energy. You want all of your solutions to have finite energy. So all of these details goes into the definition of what you call the field, the configuration space. It's the allowed field configurations. This, by the way, is also the space over which you integrate when you do the path integral. So you know it's it's, it's related to the path integral formulas. The theory is described by a Lagrangian form. I'm going to shift to now differential form notation, where instead of working with the Lagrangian density, curly L, I'm going to work with L. This epsilon is just the volume form on M. Okay, and the covariant phase space formalism is the following. You vary L in the way that I just mentioned. There'll be a bulk term here, a bulk term, which gives you equations of motion. And then there'll be a boundary term. Now, again, I've moved everything into form notation. So this boundary term, let's just understand everything over here. This is a D form, right? So this entire thing is also a D form. So theta is a D minus one form. So it's a D minus one form in space time. That's what M is, but it's also a one form in phase space or in configuration space. So how is one form? It's theta of X. X is a vector. And this thing is just a number. And what is the thing that takes in a vector as an argument and gives you a number? That's by definition what, what we call a one form. Theta is a D minus one form in M and a one form in, in configuration space. Okay, so as usual, the first term gives you all the Lagrange equations and this defines for you 
what we call the solution space. This is the space of all solutions, you know, the integration constants, once you solve the differential equation. Then you define, again, now that I have theta, what did I say we should do? We need to integrate it over your Cauchy slice, whatever Cauchy slice you want. And once you do that, that gives you capital theta, and then you need to take a D of that to get, give you the symplectic form. And that gives you what I'm gonna call, the, not I'm gonna call, what, it's, what is called the pre-symplectic form. Now, why pre-symplectic form? Why not just symplectic form? The important thing here that we missed was invertibility. The, this object, the pre-symplectic form, by construction is closed. Well, because it's exact. It's D of something. So it's exact and therefore it's obviously closed, but it is not obviously invertible. And in fact, there are many cases, and it will be the case in gauge series, which is why I'm making a big deal of it. It will be, it's not invertible generically. So what do you do when it's not invertible? What does it mean to not be invertible? It means that there exists a vector, at least one, but in generally many, many vectors, B, such that this is zero. Let me call this X null. There exists at least one vector, but oftentimes many, many more. So what do you do? You sort of treat it just like you do in sort of BRST cohomology. What you do is that you take every vector and you identify it with this vector. Remember, these are all vectors. These X's are vectors in the tangent bundle of the phase space. So you just identify these vectors. And Essentially, then what you do is you define gamma as the solution space modded out by this identification. And now by construction, because essentially you've removed all null vectors essentially by hand, the induced, uh, the induced uh, symplectic form here, this guy, and then, is necessarily going to be invertible because I've essentially removed all the null vectors by, by doing this identification. Okay, so is that? Okay, good. So I'm gonna continue because uh, yeah, looks like I'm going to do so. Okay, let me just make a couple of comments. So the first comment I want to make is that note that theta cannot be extracted uniquely because theta, is, theta only appears in this uh, variation as D of something. It's only appearing as D of something. So there's an ambiguity in theta, which, where I can take theta and shift it by d of something else, because d squared is zero. And this changes the symplectic form, but only by a boundary term. But as we'll see, it's precisely these boundary terms that we actually care about. So this is an important thing to worry about. I'm not gonna do that. We will not discuss this talk in this, uh, we will not discuss this ambiguity in this talk. A second thing to note is that despite what it looks like, you know, it looks, like omega depends on sigma, because after all, I'm integrating over sigma, right? So it should depend on sigma. But in reality, it doesn't really depend on sigma that much. It's, it has a very, very weak dependence on sigma. So consider a region, um, which is sigma over here, sigma prime over there, and then it's connected on, on this side, on these two sides by some boundary B. Uh, sorry, the same boundary. So here I mean, all of this is connected like a cylinder, right? So if I now ask, what is the difference between omega on sigma and omega on sigma prime? It's a very clear series of manipulations. Uh, you will find that it's simply related to an integral over the boundary B. And importantly, in this entire phase space formalism, it's crucial that Omega sigma should not depend on sigma. Let me explain why this is the case. How do we construct our charges for Hamiltonian vector fields? Remember, our charges are defined by F, DF is omega. So this is omega mu, del mu F, del AF, omega AB, XFB, right? So in order to obtain F, we need to use the symplectic form. Now, if the symplectic form is changing as I change sigma, this means that F changes as I change sigma. 
In other words, F is not conserved as sigma changes. That's not desirable because one example of, and, and this is in, independent of what is X of F. X of F can be anything, but if omega changes, then F changes. So for example, if I look at time translations, then, the, then if I change omega, then the Hamiltonian will not be conserved. Or translations, you know, the momentum will not be conserved. Angular momentum will not be conserved. So nothing will be if omega act depends on stuff. So it's crucial that we impose a constraint. Without imposing this constraint, we won't have a nice system to work on. Essentially, it'll describe like the flux of the energy momentum flux that's leaving the system through B. This might be an interesting thing to study if you're, if you're, if you're studying open quantum systems. Uh, I have never done that. So if, in my example that I'm thinking of, essentially B is spatial infinity, it's the full space time. So really nothing can leave. So I need to impose a constraint such that this integral over B is zero. Now remember one thing I said, that a phase space always has to be even dimensional. So if I take an even dimensional space and impose one constraint, then the new space is odd dimensional. And that's not possible. Because in the, what, what ends up happening is that the moment you impose a constraint, the symplectic form is no longer invertible. So you again have to do this manipulation of this identification business that I mentioned here in order to make it invertible. This is exactly what Dirac's procedure is in a very convoluted way, but that's what he does. Every time you have a constraint of what's called a first class constraint, you have to introduce a second class constraint in order to have a well-defined and invertible symplectic form. So as we will see, while it is true that we must impose this constraint for have a well-defined phase space and have conserved energy and, st and stuff like that, it will force us to impose a secondary constraint and that will actually play a very important role in our discussion. Okay, so let's assume that we are going to impose this constraint and once we do that, we no longer need to put a sigma subscript on omega because omega no longer depends on sigma. So I'm gonna not write that. Okay, so that's all I have to say about the covariant phase space formalism. Now I'm gonna come, I think, to the longest part of this uh, uh, talk, which does not bode well for me because I've already spent one hour on this, on this first section. So let's go through this a bit, bit more quickly, but I think it's important to get the basics down, even if you don't get, get the uh, more so advanced. Please ask them if they have any question or not. Yeah, so do you have any question before I start? Uh, okay. maybe, uh, may yeah. I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. please. Um, so you, you, the the last uh, the last term that you add that you ask to vanish. So the, in this uh, squared formula, yes. uh, framed formula. Sorry. Um, so is this uh, something that's gen usually satisfied in in our usual theories like? Uh, uh. Uh, it is usually or... assumed to be true. Let me explain why. Good, very, that's a very good question. I should have mentioned this. As I said, in my mind, I'm thinking of flat space time mm -hmm. and where in flat space time, this boundary B becomes spatial infinity. Okay. So it is it's... typically assumed that things vanish on spatial infinity. So um... we just, you know, we integrate by parts in spatial infinity without even bothering to talk about boundary terms. And so okay. we just assume that it vanishes. So As I'm going to explain in this talk, that is a bad thing to do. It is precisely the thing that gives you infrared divergences. We do not want to do that. To impose this condition. We do want to impose this condition, but we don't want to assume things vanish at infinity. So we want to impose this okay. condition in a different way. So if things vanish at infinity, then this condition is trivially true. It's obviously true yeah. because this is an integral over B and everything vanishes. This is an integral over spatial infinity and everything is zero in spatial infinity. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is true. But, and that's exactly what you do in standard quantum field theory. But that's wrong. That's not what we should do because it gives you infrared divergences. That's not a good thing to do. So what we have to do, unfortunately, is we have to impose this, that this guy vanish, but in a slightly different way. We can't allow for everything to vanish. Essentially, it's a very, it's a very simple jump. We don't, ex we don't assume that all the fields vanish. We only assume that the field strength vanishes because at the end of the day, things are gauge invariant. This theta is gauge invariant. So it re it's really a function of the field strength. So even if the field strength vanishes, the gauge field doesn't have to vanish. The gauge field can be pure gauge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And so in QFT, you assume that the gauge field vanishes. We are going to assume that the gauge field is pure gauge. Okay. And as we will see, it is pure gauge, but it is still physical. It's not, it's not trivial. Not all gauge transformations are trivial. That's part of one of, that's why large gauge transformations of which this is an example because it doesn't vanish from spatial infinity, hence large, are physical and have a role to play in, in the physics of scattering amplitude. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Okay, so let me just go through gauge series. I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, you've studied enough non-abelian gauge. These are all of my conventions. I'm just settling it down for you. Um, all of my, I have a, again, as with, I'm gonna do some completely general, like literally no, nothing, nothing special. Totally generic non-abelian gauge theory. The assumption will be that it, they're fundamental, the fundamental fields of the theory, not fundamental representation. This fundamental fields are the gauge field, obviously, and matter fields, as many matter fields as you want in whatever representation that you want, as long as they're unitary, finite dimensional, and irreducible, which I don't have written down here. But they don't even have to be irreducible. You can package the entire thing into one big irreducible thing, and that's also fine. Um, anyway, these are my conventions for the Lie algebra stuff. You know, my generators are anti Hermitian. You can go through this slide, I think. I'll just leave it on here for one or two more seconds. And then uh, this D is the covariant derivative. Again, something you know. The second D is the what's called the exterior covariant derivative. And that defines its action on adjoint valued Q forms. So for example, on the field strength, which is an adjoint valued Q, a two form. So that's how you define it. Okay, uh, let's go on. So the, as I said, the Lagrangian is totally gen general. So it, it can have as many derivatives as you want. N can go from zero to infinity on the field strength on phi and phi, phi i dagger. Notice that in writing down this structure, I have implicitly uh, assumed that you can't have chern simons terms because chern simons terms depend on the chern simons form, which is a, another gauge invariant. Well, it's not exactly gauge invariant. Now, and now because I'm interested in boundary terms, I have to actually worry about whether something is really gauge invariant or not of the boundary terms. So what I'm going to say does not apply to chern simons theory, but that's actually fine because as you may know, if you add a chern simons term in addition to a Maxwell term, well, if you don't have a Maxwell term, your, your photons are not dynamical, but if you add a, or gluons are not dynamical, but if you add a, a chern simons term in addition to a Maxwell term, then the gluons gain a mass. And so you no longer have massless gluons at square plus and square plus will be the surface that I'm interested in. So in any case, chern simons theories are not really the set of theories that I'm interested in studying. So, so maybe it wasn't completely general, but sufficiently general, I think. So the Lagrangian is invariant on the gauge transformations. That's how that acts. I've written it down here. Okay, so the variation of this Lagrangian takes that form. This is obviously the form that it has to take uh, in complete generality. Now it takes a bunch of calculation to actually work out what all of these equations are, um, what all of these terms are but they're not important. It's not even illuminating. However, I'm going to flash the slide for one minute. That's what all the equations look like, just so you can, you can stare at it for a bit, where these pi's are essentially just def defined in this way. So anyway, these are some complicated formulas. The point is that for a gen totally general action, or a totally general Lagrangian, this is what the equations of motion look like, and this is what the boundary term looks like. Okay, let's move on. Uh, as I've uh, mentioned to you before, omega sigma uh, then take this form. Now, now here we come to the point where I say that it's not invertible. Let's, let me show you how that's true. So again, this is the reason I flashed it, even though we don't, I'm not gonna go through the calculation. All the formulas are explicitly given. So I can really compute everything totally explicitly. So I can compute this quantity over here, omega sigma, Again, omega sigma is a two form. So it takes two vectors as an input, y and x epsilon. And what is x epsilon? x epsilon is this vector, which acts on my functions in this way, right? So again, everything is very explicitly given. You can really go ahead and do all the calculations. And in the paper, we have explained how, how they're done and some of this, but they're not even subtleties, it's just blindly doing math. Okay, where this Q is defined in this way. Again, the pi was defined over here. So this is a derivative with respect to f. So 
color crumbling. Okay, so notice that if epsilon vanishes on the bound, so notice that this quantity, however complicated uh, theta is, look how complicated theta is, some super complicated object. But surprisingly, after you compute this, it simplifies quite a lot. And at the, more than that, it's just a boundary term over here. So just something that depends on del sigma. So what this means is that if epsilon acting on, on del sigma vanishes, so if epsilon, the word, quote unquote, is small, then omega sigma vanishes for all choices of y, which means that x epsilon, if epsilon is small, is a null vector. This is the defining feature of gauge theories. Essentially, this is telling you that small gauge transformations are trivial on the phase space because that's what we now have to do. Remember what we said, what do we have to do? We now have to identify everything, but only if epsilon is small. We don't identify if it's large, only if it's small. So once you do this identification, then you define the space space, and then you define the symplectic form. <clears throat> the point here I'm trying to make is that small gauge transformations are trivial. This is why in this language, the covariant phase space language, this is why we identify solutions that are related by gauge, small gauge transformations. Okay, in some sense, a derivation of that statement, which I've, honestly, I've heard a lot in QFT and I never actually saw a proof from any other way. This is really the only proof I personally know of. That's not to say there isn't any. Okay, so good, we are done. Essentially, we've constructed the full phase space. Uh, now we can go on to more interesting things. Uh, what do you mean by constructing that? We have constructed the symplectic form. And I, as I said, that's all we need. Now we can invert it. We can compute canonical transformations and everything. So let's do that. Let's talk about canonical transformations. So let's remember what it means to be a canonical transformations. This is what it means. This is, may not be obvious, but this is what it means. Uh, this is the statement that I X of omega is x i x f of omega is d of f. So that's what this, so if I, if I act now on both sides with i of y and i of y df, then this side over here simply becomes omega um, y x f and this side simply becomes y of f. So it's the same formula that I wrote previously. Okay, that's what it means to be a canonical transformation. So, so let's just look, let's just look for some. So one of them is very easy to find. We already have the formula. We already have this formula right here for us, sitting right in our face. So that's this, I've just re reproduced the formula here. So in order to bring it in that form over there, all I need to do is I need to pull this outside and then I'm done. And I can do that if y acting on epsilon is zero. In other words, this is again something you guys probably assumed all the time, but we now see that it, it's not just, we have to do it. Epsilon doesn't depend on the fields. Epsilon is independent of the fields. Remember y is a vector field that acts on the phase space. So it acts on fields. So if y of something is zero, that means that quantity is independent of the fields. It could still depend on space time, but it doesn't depend on the fields. I know this is something most, I mean, I, I definitely assumed it uh, most of the time, uh, but you know, you don't have to, you could have field dependent transformations. In fact, when you do gravity, it's necessary to have field dependent transformations. So gravity is a whole different story. Anyway, so assuming all of that, then I can just move this Y outside as I've done in this, uh, in this last line. And now this is of exactly this form right here. It's exactly this form. And so therefore I can work out what is F. This is therefore the charge for gauge formations, or in other words, the large gauge charge. This generates gauge transformations on the phase space. What this means is that if I take U epsilon and act on anything, then it gives minus delta epsilon of that something. So it is literally the charge. Okay, uh, another canonical transformation that's important in any field theory, not just gauge series, but in any field theory is isometry transformations. 
So how do isometry transformations act? So they are generated by vector fields x epsilon, x, x psi, and they act on fields as the lead derivative. But this uh, psi over here has to satisfy the property that this is a killing vector. So in other words, in Minkowski space-time translations, Lorentz transformations. Good. So if I can work out what these, if I can work out the formula for this thing, again, I have all the explicit formulas written out uh, in the previous slide. So, you know, this is a, you can just do, do it by hand. Um, it takes work. You end up finding this thing. So let's, uh, let's talk about each term here. So this is what we want, right? This is, this is exactly the form again of a canonical transformation. It's Y of something. So that something is going to be the charge. So let's look at this, the form of the chart. So this first term is something that you know about. It's something that we always know about. It's just the stress tensor contracted with uh, psi and integrated over sigma. But now we see that there's additional terms, boundary terms. This is exactly the type of thing that I want to keep track of. Boundary terms will end up being related to soft modes and they will be super important. So this is something that we did not have you know, in standard um, uh, uh, constructions. But when you do this covariant phase space, you see that there must be there. And in particular, these tensors, I've, I've written them out explicitly here. Well, the tensors are defined in the next slide. Let me just briefly show it to you. Because again, you won't learn anything from it. These are those tensors, A and B, whatever, something complicated. So notice that B contains this sigma. So this is the spin, spin part. So B is present only when there are spinning fields. So gauge fields or fermion spinners or you know anything, anything that's spinning, gravity knows. Uh, but uh, A is the thing that you, so it, it doesn't get any contribution from scalar fields, but the first one is. Okay, anyway. Um, okay, so, so this shows that the, that the charge that generates isometry transformations is the usual charge, but plus additional terms. And these additional terms will be important for us. But more than that, what we notice is that there's this whole extra term here. This tells us that isometry transformations are not canonical. Now that's bad. We don't want that. Isometry transformations that are not canonical, we can't even define a Hamiltonian. In fact, we know that there are some examples in which you can't define, you know, if, if you can't take the Legendre transform, you can't define the Hamiltonian. Not all Lagrangians admit the Legendre transforms. So, you know, we don't want that. So we want to impose another constraint uh, such that uh, this second term vanishes. And uh, this constraint essentially will ensure that all uh, isometry transformations are canonical and they have a well-defined charge. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about this. Questions? Again, this part is tedious algebra. So, um. If you, want, if you have questions about algebra, you can go ahead and ask, but I don't think there's anything to learn from it. Okay. I, I have a question yeah. about the, again, this, this constraint. Um, so you, um, you have computed, computed a, a theta already. Yes. For, for the, the theory. So uh, do we know that it satisfies this constraint already? Uh, no. So for that, one part of the analysis, again, because at this point, as I said, everything is general man of general space times, general sigma. So it could be ADS, could be anything. Okay. So what I haven't yet told you, because in order for this, I need to know the boundary condition because this is an integral over del sigma. So I need to know what the field is doing at large values of near the boundary, essentially. Okay. That actually depends on whether I'm sitting in ADS. You know, in ADS, depending on the mass of the scalar field, you could have a blow up. It could be rho to the plus delta. Delta could be, you know, there's a row to the D minus delta, whether if delta is greater than D, then it could fall off. There's various possibilities. Um, sorry, if delta is less than D, then it could blow up. So it actually depends on the exact theory that you're studying. Uh, so okay. that's why I've left it here as a general rule. But in then if you actually give me a theory with a particular set of masses, then I can implement this condition. However, what I'm going to do is in flat space time, and it'll turn on in flat space time, I can do it totally generally. And I'm going to do that. But at this point, I haven't simplified at all, totally general right now. So in some general notation, this is what I want to do. You know, if you're in ADS, then go ahead and figure out how to do this, perhaps some complicated way, but 
in fact, in our case, it'll turn out this constraint is trivially satisfied. So we actually won't have to do anything about this. Yeah, because mm -hmm. in flat space time, the nice thing is everything falls off. Uh, uh, but not in the way I was, everything does fall off. You still have something left over at infinity. And despite all of that, this term vanishes. Anyway, okay, so this formula. And then, you know, you can go ahead and do, so as I said, these, uh, they generate canonical transformations under the action of the Poisson bracket. Then there's also a charge algebra, which you can work out. This is perhaps, to me at least, an interesting charge algebra, this one. But again, sort of obvious. Uh, the large, this is telling us that the large gate charge is not invariant under ISOM. So it's not, not going, for example, invariant in that space times. Or in other words, another way to think about this is that the, the isometry charge is not gauge invariant. It is small gauge invariant, which it's supposed to be. It's only required to be invariant under small gauge transformation because that's the thing that's trivial. Large gauge transformation is not trivial, so there was no need for it to be invariant under large gauge transformations. And this last line is telling us that that's indeed the case. Okay. So now I'm going to do flat space time. So pause quickly for questions. Yeah, I'm going a bit too slow. So let me let me let me rush now. Okay. So now I'm going to apply everything to flat space time. So let me just lay out my assumptions clearly. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to assume that all fields are asymptotically massless. What this means is that. Um, I need to have asymptotic states that are massless. So for example, I'm not going to say anything about confinement or anything about that sort, sort of thing. I'm going to assume that I have a theory, everything, all interactions added to it are irrelevant. In four dimensions, that it's, that's not a very stringent restriction. Um, all, uh, everything is irrelevant. And then so everything, the irrelevant interactions essentially die off at infinity. So you're more or less left with just a massless uh, theory at, at infinity. The, okay. Because things are massless, another simplification that arises for me is that I can study scry plus and scry minus as my Cauchy surfaces. Usually they're not Cauchy surfaces because I need to include time like infinity and time like, well, time like future and time like past infinity because that's where mass particles end. But because everything is massless, I can forget about time like infinity and just focus on scry plus and scry minus. And this third assumption is omega scry plus equal to omega scry minus. This is the same thing as before. This is to ensure that translation charges are conserved, energy is conserved, because otherwise you won't have a nice S matrix. The Lagrangian I'm going to break up into essentially three pieces uh, based on basically related to what's contributing, what's going to contribute and what's not. So the first time is the usual pure yang mills term. Then the matter term itself can be broken up into a kinetic terms, one for each matter field and then interacting terms. And the interacting terms, all of them contain three or more fields. And that's it. The interacting term, apart from containing with three or more fields, can be anything. No other restriction on it. And it has to be irrelevant. So no phi cube terms in four dimensions. No, yeah, no phi cube terms in four dimensions, which is fine, that's not stable anyway. Okay, uh, so the equations of motion for the gauge theory can be written in this very simple way. Essentially, J mat is where I've, you know, I had these complicated equations. Should I go back? Well, yeah. Yeah, these complicated looking equations. So this is the equations for the gauge field. So I can just massage it a little bit using the explicit form of the Lagrangian and it comes into this way. I and mean, this is not really a simplification. All I've done is that all of the complicated thing that I had in that formula explicitly, I've just simply packaged it into what I'm calling the current. So it's not really a simplification at all. Okay, so I'm gonna work in flat null coordinates, which is given there. The metric takes a very, very nice form in, these, in this coordinate system. And these coordinates are nice for the sake of flat holography, which is my eventual goal. That's kind of the reason partially that we're doing all of this is to study, uh, study uh, flat holography. They're very nice because on Scry Plus, which is where the dual CFT is living, it's living, so just like an ADS, it lives on spatial infinity for ADS. The dual theory in sort of flat holography lives on scry plus. So on scry plus, the Lorentz transformations takes a very nice form. So essentially, the action of, of Mobius transformation. So this essentially, this these coordinates are super nice because they manifestly show you the uh, the isomorphism between S1 comma three and SL2C. 
So this is these coordinates are nice for that reason. So it's kind of nice for flat holography. So that's why I'm using this. Okay, so start off. Let's let's now start off with some of the details. I'm going to rush through a bunch of. I've already explained the morals behind all of these things. So the first step we need to do is to define, as I said, the configuration space. So for this, what we need to do is to talk about uh, the falloffs of the fields at infinity. That's very easy to do because if you work out what we're going to require is that the charges are finite. So I want finite energy solutions. I want finite energy, finite angular momentum, finite momentum, everything has to be finite. Finite large gate, you know, literally everything I want to be finite. So essentially it's very obvious that what, the, what constraints, and you know, I have a quadratic phi over here. So this tells us that phi has to fall off like one over R because it has to be uh, finite in the large R limit, but not just finite. I want it to be non-zero because if it's zero, then I, everything is a zero energy. Then I don't have any scattering. So I want it to be finite and non-vanishing. Therefore, it must have a one over R coefficient and this coefficient must be non-vanishing. Okay, then I have the field strength for the gauge field. So this is just a, this is just a del U A Z. So this again tells us there's no R squared sitting in front of it. So therefore this has to be order one. And again, this leading coefficient has to be non-zero. Okay, so you can, you have to now, this is, this was only the Hamiltonian, but you can now do this for the angular momentum, momentum and all of these things. And you put everything together and you get the full class of uh, fall offs. What you end up finding is that AR falls off like a one over R squared, AU falls off like one over U. Now, AZ plus minus this, uh, this uh, structure over here at large U has to fall off like order one and phi plus also has to fall off like order one. So all of these you can simply derive using these methods that I've just mentioned. But on top of that, I remember we have to impose constraints. So the first constraint over here is that we have to impose that uh, a, uh, the theta acting on, on I zero vanishes, the integral of theta vanishes. So as I mentioned, uh, the way to make this happen is to set the field strength to zero. And uh, setting the field strength to zero essentially means that the gauge field has to be pure gauge. So remember what is spatial infinity in that diagram. Uh, let me draw it here. So I'm just gonna zoom in. So this is spatial infinity. And then it connects to I plus over here and I minus over there. So the, the region of overlap between I zero and scry plus is these two boundaries, scry minus plus and scry plus minus. So vanishing of the field strength on spatial infinity, so this direction over here is time. Vanishing of the field strength on spatial infinity is equivalent to vanishing of the field strength on scry plus, upper plus minus and lower minus plus and they have to be flat. So that's what this is flat. So that's a pure gauge for non-abelian gauge theories. But more than that, not just to, not, not, not only do they individually have to be flat, they have to be equal to each other. And this equality is coming from the fact that I need all components of the field strength to vanish. F. So this, uh, this constraint, this flatness constraint is coming from requiring that FZZ bar is zero. But I also need FTZ to be zero. Remember all components all components uh, tangent to spatial infinity has to vanish. So if FTZ is zero, then this means that AZ, spatial infinity, cannot depend on time. So del T, AZ is zero. So if it cannot depend on time, then whatever is the value here has to be equal to the value there. So for this reason, my C, op my C operator does not have a plus minus on it. It's never gonna have a plus minus on it. They're exactly equal. And C is an element of the gauge group. And finally, to fix the small gauge invariance, remember we have all of this small gauge stuff, which we had to sort of identify. So the best way to deal with it, and this is something we always do, just pick a gauge. So the gauge I'm going to work with is AU equal to zero. It's the most convenient gauge for my, my, my sake. Okay, now let's keep going. So now you can just work it out. Again, all of the formulas were so explicit, just put it in. We now have to take uh, multiple large R limits because I'm evaluating everything on scry plus and scry plus is, maybe I didn't tell you this, scry plus is located at R equal to plus minus infinity. So you just need to take R goes to infinity limits. But notice that basically everything falls off at infinity. So everything becomes super weak. So not much contributes. And essentially only the quadratic terms of the action contribute. 
the cubic terms already have too many fields in them and you're done so they can never contribute so this is one of the nice things about doing this quote unquote asymptotic quantization is that the interactions are totally irrelevant everything essentially becomes a totally free theory which is why i i had the luxury of working with generic field theories because really what i meant to do is that at the end of the day only the kinetic terms contribute so it doesn't matter what the interactions are okay so this is just the full symplectic form but at this point we have so let's go ahead and do that so in order to do that i'm going to uh, define some new new quantities for reasons that you you will see i'm going to define a hat in this way in essentially so that a hat vanishes so this a hat is the thing that when you do qft you're strictly speaking working with a hat because you're assuming that things vanish on the on, on the boundary but what i'm now arguing is that you can't work with just a hat there are two other modes which is c and n and i'm going to talk about these modes now so i just plug it in so you just plug in this decomposition into this symplectic form right here into this thing and you find this and then you use the flatness constraint and you find this uh we see it's sort of almost immediately obvious that this is not an invertible symplectic form and the reason for that is that notice that as far as n is concerned only this combination of n appears in the symplectic form so nz and nz bar doesn't separately appear only this combination is relevant and this this is supposed to be expected because before imposing constraints we had four uh, soft modes i'm going to call nz and cz so we had nz nz bar cz cz bar we had four modes then we impose constraints on c so we don't have cz and cz bar anymore we only have c so now we have an odd dimensional phase space not good can't work so there must be another constraint so which reduces the number of nz's so we can't have nz and nz bar we must have just an n and that's what this is telling us that only this combination appears so this is the only thing that's important so to fix that we just impose this constraint this is more like a gauge condition because anyway that only that combination appears so what does it matter you can choose whatever gauge is the most convenient gauge to work in so it the reason this is a convenient gauge is because you can solve it exactly so now we see that it only depends on n so we no longer have nz and cz we only have c and n and now this uh, symplectic form is totally invertible and again again i'm not going to go into to detail but perhaps an interesting feature of this is that note that uh, the symplectic form essentially breaks into a sum of pieces so the gauge series symplectic form has a gauge field as a radiative gauge field part a hat i'm going to explain the radiative and soft word soon essentially the radiative carry energy soft don't carry any energy we'll see that so a hat there's one segment with a hat there's another segment with c n and c so that's gamma soft gamma hard and then the matter fields all have their own indi individual sums so everything literally just breaks up so the entire phase space factorizes very nicely so the hilbert space is well i haven't quantized it let me not say the hilbert space so now we can invert and this is the the the, the brackets at this stage i'm sort of oh maybe i didn't mention i'm assuming for simplicity just to so i can show you explicit formulas that the matter fields are scalar fields but obviously nothing that i've said actually needs that you can generalize to any field you can also have other massive well we're not doing massive well you can have fermions that's the only other option but i'm not going to i'm just assuming everything is scalar just for simplicity okay so this is these are this is it this is the all the all the brackets that we had uh going one step further we can write out the the charges so again the just like the phase space everything is breaking up into a soft mode and a hard mode so the charges a large gauge charge breaks up into a soft piece and a hard piece uh here are the charges for the hamiltonian so this is the momentum this is the momentum charge for a function f notice that f is parameterized by four numbers so four translations notice that this is the important part notice that pf doesn't contain a soft mode 
It's only hard. It only contains a hat and phi. Why is that important? Because everything factorized. So if this depends only on a hat, that means this PF must commute with all the soft modes. And since PF is the Hamiltonian, therefore the soft modes carry zero energy. That's why I'm calling them soft. <clears throat> Similarly, you have the, heart, uh, the angular momentum tensor also in exactly the same way, basically as hard and soft. Sorry, here, hard and soft. And now you can check, you know, by explicit calculation, again, a lot of mess, but you can check that it, everything works perfectly nicely, no issues. Okay, let's summarize and I'm going to, and I'm done with this section. So in summary, we have shown that the phase space for gauge series on scry plus minus has these fields as coordinates. There's a hat which, and phi, which I'm calling the radiative fields, and then n and c, which I'm calling the uh, soft field. Oh, let me explain. I, I forgot to mention. Remember, c is an element of the gauge group, so I've written it out in the adjoint representation. So it's an element of the it's a element of the gauge group. So when written in the adjoint representation, it should, it's a matrix. So it has two AB indices. That's where that AB indices are coming from. Okay, so the brackets are really very simple. They're not really that complicated. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. Uh, okay, so summary again for the, for the charges. And again, the hard ones are not gonna matter, but I'm gonna write down the explicitly what the soft ones are. So good, I'm done with, uh, Get, now I'm going to quantize at the next step. So any questions at this point? I did rush through this, but I think most of it is just a lot of calculations and I don't think that's an interesting thing, but I'm hoping you understand the procedure so that even if you don't, are not following now, you would, if you were interested, be able to go through the calculation and do it yourself. That's sort of my goal. If you have a specific question, then ask. Otherwise you can write to him as well. Yes, uh, of course. Can I ask a question? Please. Yes, please. Uh, hi, Prar. So, does this factorization that you mentioned, does this mean that if I consider some kind of a scattering process, let's say from prime minus to scry plus, then the soft sector and the hard sector in my theory will evolve completely independently of each other? No, no. You see, my n has a plus minus sign on it. I've been very, very careful about this. Notice, very good. that's a good question. I, I didn't mention it because I, I'm out of time. Uh, but but let me point it out here. The full phase space has no plus minus sign on it. This is indicating that the full phase space remains invariant no matter whether I'm sitting on scry plus or on scry minus. It doesn't matter. But the decomposition of this phase space into soft modes and hard modes and matter modes and everything depends on a very complicated way. I mean, that's the whole point of the S matrix. That is the S matrix. It depends in a very complicated way on whether I'm sitting on scry plus or scry minus. So it's not at all true that the soft goes to soft and hard goes to hard. There's a strong coupling. In fact, as I'm going to show, there's a, there's a unique coupling. So if I can tell you that in the initial hard state and the initial uh, final out hard, hard state, it fixes the vacuum states as well. I see, thank you. Not only is it not independent, in fact, it's completely correlated. Right. Yeah, I just, I just had in mind these claims that have appeared in the literature over the years uh, that, you know, say that the soft hair are like soft wigs. And so, you know, whether you can do transformations on phase space to end up decoupling these sectors completely. But I, I see that you're, you know, um, you're saying that it's, that's not the case. Yeah. No, that's just not the case. That's not possible. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. Let's just quantize. But now this is canonical quantization. So it, you know all of this. So I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Everyone knows what canonical quantization is. All we do is we take functions on gamma and elevate them to operators acting on a Hilbert space. And the bracket, Dirac or Poisson, doesn't really matter in this language whether it's a Dirac bracket or a Poisson bracket, is elevated to a quantum commutator. Okay. So let's just do it. Again, all of this is standard stuff. So we can sort of go through it quickly. So let's just start with a simple one, something that you will all know, radiative Hilbert space. So this is the commutator. So all I've done is replaced, oh, this should have been my, my bad. I did not, end up, so this should be commutator and there should be factor of i over here. 
Okay, so these are all commutators. Now I, I'm going to define these operators. At this point, it looks like I've pulled it out of the hat, uh, but these are in fact annihilation operators for omega positive because given these definitions and given these commutators, it's a, just a matter of computation to show that uh, this commutator is satisfied. Okay, where p? Just just to be clear, here I had a here here I had a p which is a function of omega z, z bar. Uh, so this object is a function of what I'm calling momenta, p. And on this side, I only have omega z, z bar. So I need to have a map between p and omega z, z bar. And that's this map over here. And this p squared squared zero, so it's a mass momentum. So this is exactly the commutators of uh, creation and annihilation operators. And now you guys know what to do. You start by defining a vacuum state. Now. Here, we don't have a unique vacuum. We have a vacuum labeled by U, as I'm going to explain literally in the next slide. So it's, we just define my vacuum states to be annihilated by annihilation operators. And then you use creation operators to construct the rest of the radiative Hilbert space. Cool? So what's left is not to just talk about the vacuum states. Then we'll be done. Vacuum states. So now we just have to look at the vacuum sector. This is the commutators in the vacuum sector. Again, it's very easy to do. C commutes with itself. So obviously that's where we should start. Since C commutes with itself, we diagonalize C and construct a basis and its Hermitian. So we can actually construct the basis. So this is what this U stands for. It's the eigenvalue of C, of the operator C. And it, this did confuse me for a bit. So let me just explain it. So there's a plus minus here. The reason there's a plus minus here is not because C has a plus minus. Remember C has no plus minus, it's equal on square plus and square minus. But this plus minus is coming from this definition of the vacuum state here, the radiative definition. Because as, as I said, the radiative modes depend on whether I'm sitting on square plus or square minus because a, a radiative mode on square minus could map and does in fact map to both radiative and soft modes on square plus. So there's a huge mixing. So this is where the plus minus sign plays a role. But C doesn't care whether it has a plus minus sign. And I'm, and I'm normalizing my fields with this, again, this left invariant R measure. Uh, so I, I didn't mention this, but since I was writing out all the explicit formula here, here, this is what I mean by why I was using left invariant is because the way I've defined C, it transforms under gauge transformations in this way. Epsilon acting from the, from the left. So that's why left invariant. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, no. I said like uh, you explained it nicely. Thank you. Okay. Left invariant. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So the the states are normalized in this way. Again, this is just a basis state. So of course I can expand any state, any vacuum state in this basis. And this f of u is what I'm going to call the vacuum wave function. Okay, so far so good. So this defines my basis state. What's left is to simply work out the, the, the action of N. Now then I'm done. Then I have literally nothing else to do. And that's very easy because the action of N I can work out, it's almost trivial because this, is, this, this, this brackets are very, very similar to X, X is, X, X is zero. X, uh, P is roughly one. And P, 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 A, P, B, is roughly F A B C B C. And if you've ever seen these sort of brackets, you, you may or may not know that there's always a linear transformation that you can do uh, to go to another basis of X's and P's which satisfy the standard commutation relations. So all you need to do is go to that basis. And then once it's in the standard basis, then we know how P acts because P is simply a derivative. And then you just work out the derivative and then work backwards. So that's what, that's what we did. So it's just this. After all of that hullabaloo, it turns out to be just this formula right here. Where now I have this definition of the derivative, it's a derivative operator, which means it satisfies the product rule. So if I have a product of u's, then I should just use the product rule. And it's, uh, it, it's defined by this equation. We actually won't end up needing anything else, but in the next slide, I'm gonna give you an explicit formula for it. It's very nice. We haven't explored it. I like the, 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 the structure is sort of very interesting. And we haven't explored it at all because we didn't need it at all. All we need is this formula, but I'm very interested in sort of seeing what, where that can go. 
but all we'll need is this formula. So let me just leave it there. So we can, it follows from this that Q epsilon is acting on the vacuum state. So that JY acting on this. Importantly, note that the generic state, vacuum state, is not Lorentz invariant. Again, this goes back to the fact that the angular momentum tensor had a soft part. Now, again, this goes against QFT because we assume in QFT, firstly, we assume there's a unique vacuum, and next, we assume that that vacuum is Lorentz invariant. None of that is true. There are infinitely many vacua. Most of them are not Lorentz invariant. So which one is the vacuum state that QFT is assuming? It's the one which has u equal to 1. Remember, if I said u equal 1 over here, uh, then this gives me u, u z is 0. And if u z is equal to 0, this guy vanishes, and then this entire thing becomes 0. So the u equal to 1 vacuum state is Lorentz invariant, and this is the state that when you do standard Feynman diagram calculations, you're implicitly assuming. That's the one you're implicitly assuming when you're doing computations. So we will use this later on. Okay, uh, finally, we can also define the operator that generates uh, large sort of finite gauge transformations, if you wish, just, you know, exponentiation. That's a standard thing. I'm gonna write it right here. Also, that's, uh, that's, that's a typo. This should be omega g. OK, all done. Questions? OK. Um, OK, this is the slide I was mentioning. So there's a very interesting slide. This, uh, this expansion, by the way, here, if you do a Taylor expansion, it's just the Bernoulli numbers. This operator has something interesting to do with the Bernoulli numbers showing up here, which I don't know much about what to do, but I think it's, I think that's an important fact. I don't know why, it's just intuition. So don't ask me any questions on that, but this is something we derived using explicit computation really, so nothing more than that. Okay, almost done with section one. The last step is for me to define the S matrix because I'm gonna derive, uh, what I'm, what I'm going to do is, of course, derive a word identity for the S matrix. So I should tell you guys what an S matrix is. So an S matrix is a very simple object. It's, we already alluded to it. It's the overlap between an in state and an out state. And this, again, is, a, this is all where all the complication comes from. So remember, in asymptotic quantizations, we had so much simplification. Everything simply became free. So you might have wondered, well, if everything becomes free, where is the complication arising? Where, when, what is the thing that's actually complicated? How could you possibly get an S matrix out of it? Well, the complication arises in the fact that the mapping, because remember, we are using two different coordinate systems on gamma. We, there's a plus coordinate system, and there's a minus coordinate system. They're both coordinate systems on the same phase space. Therefore, there must be a coordinate map between phi plus and phi minus. And this map is known as the S matrix. And this is a very complicated object and depends on literally all the details of the theory. And that's the part I haven't said anything about because, well, I can't. Uh, that's a very super complicated object. So, and that's the thing that, that's of course, we are all interested in knowing how to compute. So it's essentially in quantum field theory, it's just simply defined as the overlap between in and out states. But in reality, how we compute it is using the LSE reduction formula we don't actually compute overlap of states. We compute something that's very, very slightly different, but that slight difference will exactly be the thing that's of interest to me. Uh, that's a typo. Okay, so what we compute is using the LSC formula. So the left-hand side is what we compute is the definition. So this, this is really a definition over here, where the operators are defined in this way. This is the standard LSC reduction formula. So don't really have much to say about that. Uh, so in, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip all of this. What you can do is you can explicitly choose an explicit parameterization for my off-shell momentum P squared. Remember, I have to take the limit. So I have to start off with an off-shell momentum and then take a limit. In the gauge you're working in, you can work out what the polarization tensors are because I'm working in AU equal to zero. You can substitute and literally explicitly compute this full quantity. And here's what I get. After all of this, uh, I get this formula right here. So just this formula, this equality. 
again, this is something you probably know. If you maybe if you if you haven't looked at it for a long time, maybe not. But this is something you probably know. The point is that you don't actually compute what would have been insertion of an overlap would would be if there was only one term on the left hand side, on the right hand side. But there are two terms. But this is in reality just one term only. The reason being is that if omega is positive, then the right hand side is an annihilation operator. And now remember there's a time ordering, right? There's a T. There's this time ordering operator sitting in here. Because it's a time ordering operator, this the plus one, which is the out, this is the out. Oh God. Sorry, this is the out object. This is the in object. So this is scry minus this is minus. So because of the presence of the time ordering operator, all the scry minus operators go to the left, go to the right, and all the scry plus operators go to the left. And if both operators are annihilation operators, then the scry minus operator well annihilates its vacuum and just doesn't contribute. So if omega is positive, only this first term contributes. If omega is negative, then both of them are creation operators, then only this second term contributes. So whenever omega is either positive or negative, only one term contributes, and we are indeed computing an overlap of stakes. However, when omega is equal to zero, and this is where the subtlety comes in, now in that soft limit, it reduces to an insertion of nz. And now, even if both of them move and hit their respective vacua, they will neither of them annihilate the vacuum. You know, they act on the vacuum because this nz is hit. Remember, nz was a constrained mode. I had to impose a constraint on it. So it acts on the vacuum state in some complicated way. Neither of them annihilates, both of them contribute. So this is something that, you know, when I was doing my PhD, something I spent literally nine months on trying to figure out there was a factor of two issue and I just could not figure it out. The resolution is precisely this, that there are two different contributions, both from Scrapless and both from Scrapless. Okay. And this is coming from, because we compute things via LSE reduction form. That's how we actually compute anything. Even non perturbatively that's actually how we compute S matrices. Okay, good. That's all I need to define my uh, S matrix. Let's go on with the word identity. This is like the fastest section. There's really nothing, nothing to it. It's, it'll, it'll seem so trivial. So the first thing is very simple. I'm going to use this crucial fact that C doesn't have a plus or minus label on it. It's a very nice thing. On top of that, C uh, commutes with all of the operators that appear in an S matrix. Let's understand this. What are the operators that appear in the S matrix? Well, they, they're either the radiative modes, which uh, C commutes with directly because they're all radiative, or if they're a zero mode, they're only appearing in this very special combination, NZ plus minus NZ minus. And while C does not commute with NZ and it doesn't commute with NZ minus, it commutes with this difference. Uh, let's quickly remind ourselves that that's the case here. Here, notice that this commutator of C with N, uh, you can now see the essentially the right hand side has no plus minus sign on it anywhere. So if I take N plus minus N minus, then the C commutes with this quantity because there's not, no, no plus minus symbol on the right hand side. Everything is canceled. So this is a very nice property. So it's either radiative modes for which it commutes, or if it's a soft mode, it appears in this very precise combination. So it also commutes. So C actually commutes with all operators that ever appear in an S matrix. So since that's the case, I can derive a super easy word identity. I start with C on this side, and then I just keep moving it because it commutes and I get no extra term. I move it all the way there. That's what I have over here. And they have to be equal to each other, which means if I subtract them, there is zero. But now C acts on this vacuum state to give me U and C acts on this vacuum state to give me U prime. And so I just have a total factorization. So this tells me this uh, very simple formula straight away. That if I have two different vacua, the S matrix has to be such that, oh, you, this is U and U prime. Delta U minus U prime. And then whatever is left over, I'm just, this is just a name for it. Whatever is left over, I'm calling it U with a sub U because it could in principle depend on U. 
And now next we use the large gauge transformation. Now another thing, the large gauge transformation is also an object which does not have a plus minus sign on. Why? Because the large gauge charge was derived using the Hamiltonian vector field construction. So it was derived from the symplectic form. And our assumption, which is a correct assumption, is that the symplectic form does not depend on square plus or square omega square plus equal to omega square minus. That was assumption number three. So my Q, just like J and P, none of them, neither of them have plus minus signs on them. So because of that, my omega, this, uh, the thing that generates large case transformation doesn't have a plus minus sign either. So I can again derive a very, very trivial, uh, trivial war identity. I, I start off with, I start off with omega inverse on this side and omega on this side. Then I just introduce additional omega omega inverses in the middle. And then I recall this property. Again, omega does not have a plus minus sign. So it acts on the plus vacuum states exactly as, you, as it does in the minus vacuum states. And I just get this totally general word identity. And now to simplify this, it's very easy. I'm just, what I'm going to do is I'm going to over here, look at this. I'm going to set G equal to U. And if I set G equal to U, then this quantity is now being evaluated in the U equal to one vacuum. But as we've said before, that's the QFT vacuum. That is precisely the QFT vacuum. So we're done. So putting everything together, let's put all, everything that we learned together, we end up getting this formula in the box, which I've explained previously, but now I hope you understand a bit more. And just, just to understand where you get this R from, I just, just so I, I say a few more words, because that's, how, that's the gauge transformation of, that's, that's exactly the gauge transformation of these objects. Uh, let me maybe explain this a little bit more. See, OI of PI were, the, were these operators that appear in the LSC theorem, right? So let's go back and uh, stare at this formula for a bit. So this is an example. This is for the gauge field, but it could also be for a matter field. So the O operators appearing over here are functions of P, but when you map them onto fields on scribe plus over here, they end up becoming functions of omega ZZ bar, local functions of omega ZZ bar where again, the mapping between P and Z is precisely, precisely the one given here. So large gate, we know how large gate transforms act on local functions on scry plus. They just act locally at that point. So that's what's happening here. So uh, these, are, these operators, even though they don't look like it, sorry, these operators, are local functions on scry plus locally localized at the point z z bar z i z i bar z i z bar and so when i do a gauge transformation which is what i'm doing here i'm also going to get a large gauge transformation with precisely also localized at z i z i but that's why you have a z i z i bar on this side okay so i just wanted to make that clear so now i think everything should be clear and, I, and i've rewritten z i z i bar as p hat because that's what the direction corresponds to Okay, and now I can generalize one extra step. In why, do, why should I work with basis states? I can work with any state, and then I have a sort of clear factorization. So the QFT part totally comes out over here, has no U dependence whatsoever, and the entire vacuum state dependence comes into this path integral. We have to do this sort of path integral to work out the vacuum state uh, contribution. Okay, so it's a total factorization. This is what I mean when I said in, my, in the title of my talk, soft factorization. So all the vacuum contributions, by, by which I mean the soft contributions to the amplitude, completely factorizes up. And everything else that's left over is just the QFT amplitude. So that for that, you have to do Feynman diagrams or work very hard, do amplitudes, whatever. Compute this quantity. Okay, let me continue. And I'm only gonna talk about the single soft theorem. I won't get time to talk about the double soft theorem, and then we'll stop. So we did a lot of stuff. As I said, I wanted to use this talk mostly as, as a perhaps introduction to covariant phase space. What I've done in this paper with Temple, what we have done is used the covariant phase space formalism very carefully to derive everything that we could. 
And then we derived, well, to construct everything that we could, and then we derived the simplest possible thing from there, which was this factorization formula. The interesting thing is that given the formalism that we have now set up, there's many, many more generalizations that one could look, look at. And we are obviously doing that. And there are a lot of interesting sort of future prospects. So what I'm kind of going to talk about today is literally the simplest thing that you could do. But I did, that's why I wanted to spend a lot of time setting up the formalism because that's more important. The result over here is really not that, in my opinion, not that, uh, they're not surprising, you know, something I totally expected. Okay, so let me just finally, in this, in this final uh, few minutes, set up for you uh, the soft theorem, prove to you that the soft theorem can indeed be derived. Uh, in fact, if you have been following what I said, you should be able to do this on your own. So, uh, but most likely you aren't, you haven't been following everything. So let, let me just do it here. So the first line is, this is what we call the soft theorem. This is what, how one derives it in, you know, Weinberg derived it for gravity and QED. This other people derived it in, in gauge series, a non-abelian gauge series. This, this is the standard momentum space formula. Um, then, sorry. Okay, I stop. Sorry, yeah, okay. So this is a standard, standard formula in momentum space. Um, so I'm hoping you all know exactly everything over here. I have on the left hand side, I have an n plus one point amplitude. So let me just write down, draw things in pictures. I have an n plus one point amplitude with a bunch of particles and one gluon. So that's this one gluon. So Prabhu, it, it is yeah. written as q0 tending to zero. Is it q tending to zero or q0? Well, it's the same thing. Q0 is the, is the energy of the momentum. Ah, okay, okay. okay. So if Q0, ah, Q0 ah. goes to zero, then the entire momentum has to go to zero. I can understand. I can understand. Oh, okay. Because after all, this momentum is massless. So Q vector true, is true, Q0. True, true. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the soft theorem is a statement about a soft factorization of the amplitude. So you might have expected of from the outset that we should be able to derive it. So the, the formula is very simple. It's telling us that if I have an n plus one point amplitude with one gluon, and I take this gluon to be soft, then the result is this original n point amplitude, the same original one, but now with a soft factor attached to it. And that's the standard notation for, for uh, uh, that Sn is the standard notation, Sn is zero. Zero is a standard notation on that for the soft theorem. Okay, uh, remember that this was derived using Feynman diagrams, or maybe amplitudes, whatever. There are multiple ways to derive, but it was derived in what I what I like, what I what I'm calling standard quantum field theory, which means that this is a formula that's only valid when u is one. It's not valid for general u. However, we will be able to do something far more powerful because we have a factorization formula for all u. So we'll be able to derive a soft theorem for arbitrary u. And then of course, I'm just gonna take u goes to one and just check that it verifies with this, but we are able to derive a more general soft theorem for arbitrary uh, back here. So before I do that, let me rewrite the soft theorem in a, in a, in a better way, which is the second, last, the second two equations. And I'm only gonna focus on this first one. They're totally identical. Literally all I've done here is I parameterize the momenta. Remember the momenta can be parameterized in terms of omega z, z bar, as I've been saying, all I did was do that. And then this entire quantity over here, this entire quantity over here simplifies to just one over z minus zk. So it's very simple. So let's now derive this formula in a separate way using our, using our main result. So it's very simple. We re let's recall that we already showed this, that when I take omega to zero, multiply by omega and then take O plus. So maybe let me show you that formula. Here, this formula right here. So if omega is zero, if, if I'm taking multiplying by omega and then taking omega to zero, I showed here, I didn't explain this much because of time, that the LSE theorem tells us that you must insert nz plus minus nz minus. That's what is required. 
and then nz is related to c and n in this way in this way so going back so all we have to do is insert nz plus minus nz minus but now it's very clear because this is a time ordering operator over here and n commutes with everything else remember everything else is hard the single soft limit is one soft particle and everything else is hard so everything else is radiative so then n is a soft mode so it commutes with everything else so i can just move this along totally without any any worry and it goes and hits all the way over here and it hits the vacuum this n goes all the way over here and hits the vacuum and then all i need to do is figure out how it acts but it's very simple because I know what is the formula for N. I know how N acts on the vacuum. I know how C acts on the vacuum. It's really just a matter of computation and you get these two formulas. I have to do some bit of algebra, which really, and this is it. This is the full soft theorem. Wait, this is not the full soft theorem. Sorry, there's one more step. You get this. Now notice that we still have to evaluate this quantity, but we know how to evaluate this quantity because of our formula. So far, we haven't used our main result. We have only used standard canonical quantization results. But now we know how to evaluate this quantity. Why? Because this quantity is simply over here. This, is, this was our precisely the main result. It's just a bunch of factors in front times the QFT amplitude. So we know how the derivative acts. Again, that's why I said we only need to know this formula. We don't really need anything else. So we know how the, how the derivative acts. And it's a product, it's a, uh, it's a derivative operator, so it satisfies product rule. So essentially, I just have to act on both sides with dA. And it just acts on this entire product. So I just use product rule. I get a bunch of terms. That's why I have a sum over k. For each term, I, I act on it, I use this formula over here. And then I reduce it down to this. And this is the soft theorem. And you can now check if I set u equal to one, which remember what I mean by u equal to one is u equal to one as a matrix. So what I mean is u a b equal to delta a b. So if you just set this over here, you'll end up getting the soft theorem. The soft theorem, remember, because this will then reduce to simply t a k over z minus z k, which is precisely what the soft theorem was, simply t a k over z minus z k, and the factor of square root two i g that matches up. So we can derive the soft theorem. We can derive the soft theorem as well. More than that, if you derive a single soft theorem, you can derive double soft theorems. And so the, I'm not going to go through this, but you can derive the double soft theorem if you want. So now let me end. Uh, let me just summarize. And so in summary, we derive this, uh, in my opinion, very interesting factorization formula, um, which essentially tells you how to evaluate the uh, S matrix in any vacuum states, any two vacuum states. Uh, a consequence of that formula was that we reproduce consecutive soft limits. Simultaneous soft limits are a bit more interesting. We are working on this now. There's some interesting stuff going on and it's a bit more difficult. In fact, it's the reason this paper took so long. I started working on this paper a year ago. The reason I spent such a long time on this is because we, I don't know, I think we spent six months on the simultaneous soft limits and we still haven't figured it out. So there's definitely some work to be done there. Okay, you might have thought, well, everything was classical. You worked with the classical action. You did essentially, uh, essentially, uh, roughly semi-classical analysis because you did canonical quantization. That's roughly semi-classical. But in fact, what I did is totally general. And because it's totally general, it's in fact also totally quantum mechanical because I could have instead worked with the one PI effective action Suppose I'm all powerful and I can compute the full 1PI effective action. At the end of the day, what is the 1PI effective action going to be? It's going to be an action of exactly the same form that we have with sort of infinitely many high derivative terms. But we included all of those in our discussion. We didn't simplify at all. So our analysis completely applies to the 1PI effect. And the 1PI effective action is something that we should be treating at tree level, right? The whole point of the 1PI action is that the classical results from the 1PI effective action is the quantum results of the full action, of the original action. So I could have well started with the 1PI effective action. The only term that will contribute is the kinetic term. And the only contribution, because the 1PI effective action has to preserve all the symmetries, the only thing it can do to the kinetic term is modify the coupling constant. 
and it modifies it to what the renormalized coupling constant. That's all. So everything we have done, in fact, generalizes completely quantum mechanically to all loop orders, everything. Because all you need to do is replace G with renormalized G, and that's it. Is that point clear? So even though it looked like everything I was doing was totally classical, 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 but in reality, because I was, I was making everything totally general, what I've ended up doing is actually obtaining the full quantum result. This is, an, in fact, another way of showing that the soft theorem has to be loop exact, has to be tree level exact, up to renormalization of the coupling constant. So every loop contribution, every loop correction can be absorbed into a redefinition of G. OK, now I like you a little bit, and this is perhaps the most interesting part of this, which I, it's, it's ongoing work. Uh, I like you a little bit. In, it's not exactly loop exact, uh, because I, what I meant when I said that you can do the 1T effective action, I meant you can renormalize in, and include all UV, UV corrections. So everything I've done completely is valid to include uh, renormalized corrections as long as all UV um, divergences are removed and everything is removed. What I cannot remove so far is the IR divergent contribution. And there are, there are those. So gate theory has lots of IR divergent contributions and they precisely contribute. Sorry, my Siri is constantly. Uh, yeah, so, and because IR divergent contributions are precisely the things that contribute at large distances, that's, what they're, that's why they're called. So you have to treat them a bit separately. So in, in essence, what you end up finding with IR divergent contributions is that the QFT amplitude itself is divergent. And it has a divergence of this form lambda by mu. Lambda is not a UV cutoff. Lambda is roughly a sort of the cutoff that defines soft modes and mu is the IR cutoff. So that's, that's the language that, that we like to use. And it's typically just lambda over mu raised to some power, alpha, which is a function of all the representations. Essentially, it's a function of the quadratic casimirs of all the representations. So the hope, this is what we're working on right now, is that here, this amplitude is IR divergent. The question that we're trying to answer is that, is there a choice of these vacuum wave functions so that there's also an IR divergence here, but this divergence cancels that IR divergence so that the full amplitude is finite. Does that make sense? We want, what we want is an IR finite S matrix. That's what I would love. So to do that, there's only, I, we feel there's one way to do it, which is that we take the IR divergence that is already there in the QFT amplitude, and we try to absorb that into my definitions of F and F prime in some way. So essentially that after I do this path integral, I end up getting an IR divergent cutoff. And we've done a bit of that, and then we, the results are very interesting. So the question is, what F should we actually use? So this, what I'm saying actually has already been done for QED. So it's not really a new thing. It's been done for QED since for a long time ago, perhaps not in our, this language. In the language. In the language that we're talking about, this was done by Andy. And what he did was he essentially showed that if you look instead at states which diagonalize the charge and you evaluate so what we were doing was we were looking at states which diagonalize C, which diagonalize uh, C. But Andy suggested, well, let's instead look at states that diagonalize Q epsilon. And he showed that if you indeed look at such states, then everything is great. Everything is fantastic. You end up getting a totally IR finite S matrix. Now in non-abelian gauge theories, we can't do that because Q doesn't commute with itself. Q, Q epsilon prime is, you epsilon slope prime. So it's not actually possible to choose to diagonalize uh, to, to, to diagonalize all of the Q epsilons in one go. And so we have to look for something else. Uh, now this would this would have come up in the double soft theorem, but it, since it did not, but in, this is an interesting fact of the commutators we looked at. It turns out that NZ commutes with NW, though NZ does not commute with N, NW bar. So this is not true. 
So what I can do is I can diagonalize NZ. So this will sort of be a complexification because I'm diagonalizing NZ, but not NZ bar. So it sort of forces you into studying complex uh, states. Maybe you get an amplitude that's not entirely unitary, but it's un not unitary in a very simple way because I know exactly how to capture this non-unitarity. Um, so it's not that big of a deal. But we sort of did that and it was very interesting because at the end of the day, you have to ask what are these functions that you end up getting over here? And what we end up finding is that this function end up giving you the WZW mod. So this I think is sort of, I would say a very concrete example. Okay, maybe I don't, well, a concrete example of one part of flat holography. So it's telling you there's a 2D theory whose correlation functions capture at least some sector of the four dimension theory. And I think that to me is very interesting because I don't think there's ever been an explicit example of flat holography, which is I think why flat holography is so slow. Like ADS-CFT, you know, the moment we had an actual example of ADS-CFT, it was, you know, there was a lot of development there. So it would be great to have an actual example. Well, of course, it's not a full example because it doesn't capture all the physics. It only captures the soft sector. But I think that's pretty rich. That, that already has a lot of information in it. So maybe that's not, that's not too bad. So I would say that's, that's an interesting uh, comment that I'd like to make. It's something that we're thinking about for the future and how to see these, these WZW models appearing in the non-vegan uh, gauge theories. So with that, I think I will end. And I really want to thank you for listening. It was a long talk. If you haven't fallen asleep, I hope it was helpful to you. And please ask any questions if there are. Yeah, guys, please ask if you have question. And just before that, uh, please unmute yourself and give a clap for uh, Proho for giving such a elaborative and nice talk, which I am, I believe, uh, truly helpful for all the students. Uh, I will post it in YouTube, you guys can see from there as well, if you have missed any point. And if you want to understand more, you can chat with uh, Prohor uh, by writing to him. Uh, there is a question in the chat box, I think. Sir, could you share the lecture PPT? This is not allowed. I don't allow this. Okay. I, I, uh, this uh, uh, whole thing will be uploaded, uploaded in the YouTube. So you can actually see the whole stuff. So particularly, uh, there is no need to give the uh, presentation. If it is a uh, like kind of a writing talk or something presentation like that, then I would suggest to do that, but it is not. Uh, so, yeah, so guys, you, if you have any question, please ask and please unmute yourself and give a clap for them. And with his talk, we just finished the 49th uh, talk and thank you Proho for, uh, 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 for your contribution. And it is very nice because I think this is the first talk on uh, soft theorem related topic in this forum. So it would be really great that you have make it possible. And uh, even if it is big, but it is quite elaborative and I'm uh, pretty sure that that will be very helpful. So um, guys, please ask question. If you don't have, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that whether people are there or not. Uh, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, please ask, then why you were... Oh, no, I was just... Okay. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. For just looking at your final formula that you showed in the, in the conclusion slide, the main result of the talk, yes. I was just wondering if there is, it's coming back to my earlier question, is there a way to see somehow from this formula that the hardened soft sector your theory, if you evolve from square minus to square plus, sort of mix uh, non-trivially, because this sort of factorization sometimes gets, um, you know, misunderstood as saying that the evolution also factorizes. 
Yeah, so let me explain. That. That's a good question. Let me explain that. It, it is all related to IR divergences. The point is that if you work in generic vacuum states and generic hard states and everything is totally generic, then there's this factorization formula. And indeed, it basically looks like it doesn't even, this formula at least seems to suggest that it doesn't even matter what the hard states are, you know? The vacuum part of the factorization formula doesn't care about the hard states. I mean, apart from the location Z1 to Zn, but that makes sense, you know, that's sort of, they're puncturing the celestial sphere at those points. But apart from that exact position, they don't really care about any of the details of the theory. Or even, so that's, that's what it suggests. However, the point that I'm, well, I, have, I didn't make that point, but the point that is in this infrared divergence sector is that you actually can't do that. You can't choose generic vacuum states. You can't choose generic hard states. Well, you can choose generic hard states, but once you choose whatever hard states you want to scatter, you have to choose only those vac states for which you get a finite S matrix, because otherwise you don't actually have a well-defined quantity. You can't check for unitarity, you know, you can't check at Kosky rule. You don't even have a well-defined quantity, right? So you are not free to choose your vacuum states given all the set of hard states. The conjecture is that given your favorite choice of hard states, whatever you want to scatter, if I want to do Compton scattering and whatnot, there is, well, the great thing would be this, I don't know. Best thing would be given your choice of hard states, there is a unique choice of vacuum state for which the um, this total scattering amplitude, including all of these vacuum contributions, is IR finite. And only that is the right quantity to talk about. Any other S matrix is not even the right quantity. This is essentially how we understand IR divergences even today, right? How do we understand? We say S matrices are divergent, so we should never talk about the S matrix. We should talk about cross sections. And we should talk about inclusive cross sections and and a differential cross, whatever, you know, the, all of the d decay rates and all of those sort of things. Those are the physical things because those are the things you actually measure. We should not talk about the S matrix because that's divergent. I'm saying essentially the same thing, but in, in the list of things that we should consider, I'm adding one extra thing. I'm saying, yes, let's consider, uh, I, I, again, I'm not saying this, uh, you know, the, the entire asymptotic symmetry, uh, you know, everyone working on this has this essentially this idea is that, that uh, in addition to decay rates, uh, inclusive cross sections, all of these things, go ahead and consider those. But on that list, we should also have the S matrix, but with the appropriate choice of vacuum. That is also a measurable quantity. And in fact, uh, uh, there have been suggestions of how to even measure uh, precisely these vacuum state contributions. And the, all of these things are called what's called memory effects. And so there are experiments that you can perform which measure precisely these vacuum state contributions. Even though they're vacuum, there's zero energy, uh, there's a way to measure uh, their effects on an experiment. And in fact, people are working on how to measure them at CERN. It's not really, I mean, I'm not an experimentalist or even, I'm not even a theorist who works on experimental stuff, so I wouldn't be able to tell you all the details. But I, I, can, tell you the, I can tell you the example in, in GR. So it's literally identical. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of this memory effect. So what happens, and so think about the LIGO. So what happened when the, the gravitation waves came? The way we measured the gravitation waves is that we had two mirrors, which were perfectly stationary with respect to each other. And then the wave happened and then they started wobbling around. Now, just like gauge theory amplitudes carry infrared divergences and soft modes, uh, gravitational amplitudes also carry soft modes because after all, gravitation is also another example of a non-abelian gauge theory at the end of the day, right? So it also carries soft modes, which are zero energy. So you cannot measure them with an energy detector. But what happens is that if you have the mirror, suppose they're a distance of one meter apart or whatever they were, hundred meters apart. And then the gravitation wave comes and the wobbling happens. So the wobbling tells you that a wave has passed. After the wave has passed and everything is totally settled down, if you have extremely good measurement systems, you will find that after settling down, the mirrors are no longer at 100 meters apart. They are shifted by some other distance. And the change in the distance is a DC effect. And that DC effect is encapsulating precisely this vacuum transitions. 
is in the sense that in QFT, we assume that the vacuum is unique. So the in vacuum is the same as the out vacuum, but indeed in any experimental setup also, that is just not true. There's always a vacuum transition and the vacuum transition is captured by this memory effect, which in the case of gravity is simply just a distance between the measure. So uh, there's no sense. And, and, and in fact, that vacuum transition is completely fixed by the properties of the radiative mode. So there's a unique mapping between the radiative sector, the gravitational wave with the, that carries energy, and the actual DC shift which measures the vacuum state. So they're not at all independent of each other. Got it, thank you. Any other question? Um, I, I have a question. Um, is there um, a way to modify this if for gravity? Um, oh, definitely, definitely. This is sort of most of the work by Barnish and Kozark have been doing this. Yeah, I was so supposed in, to ask that same question. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah please. So in, in the case of gravity, most of the work has been done for BMS, I shouldn't say for dimensional gravity, because 3D gravity is far, far more simple. Uh, this sort of stuff has been done. Well, I have a paper. I have multiple papers on the gravity aspect of this as well. Uh, so just like in, in, uh, in flat space time, we have two types of symmetries, uh, rotations, Lorentz symmetry rotations and translations. When you include gravity, it turns out that the symmetries enhance. And instead of translations, you have what's called super translations. And instead of rotations, you have what's called super rotations. The so super has nothing to do with supersymmetry. Totally, it, the, the, they were named even before supersymmetry was discovered. So there's something called super translations and a super rotations. And these are things that show up in the case of gravity. Super translations have been perfectly studied. They're very, very nice. Everything is cool. You know, we know everything about them. Super rotations are Unfortunately, the most interesting one, because it uh, corresponds to the dual theory having a Virasoro symmetry. So you can actually extend it to a full CFT. What I was discussing today, I said that because the mapping is between Lorentz transformation and SL2C, that doesn't give you full conformal symmetry. In two dimensions, as you know, the conformal symmetry is Virasoro. So the super rotations essentially are Virasoro transformations. However, if you try to do this entire thing that I just explained to you in this talk for super rotations, practically everything breaks down. Like nothing is finite. Either, either you only have, there's two options. Either if you do everything exactly like I said, you know, everything is finite, everything is great, you, and you construct the phase space, then you can't have super rotations. Basically the boundary conditions forbid super rotations. So the only way to include super rotations is to modify a boundary conditions by allowing some charges to be infinite. Now, that's not that bad a thing. This actually happens, it even happens in nature. The, uh, a, a simple example of that is spontaneous symmetry breaking. Spontaneous symmetry breaking is an example where once you're sitting in the new vacuum, where the symmetry is not preserved anymore in the new vacuum, in that new vacuum, the charge that generates that's the spontaneously broken part of the symmetry is no longer finite. It doesn't have finite norm, right? That doesn't mean it's a bad symmetry it's still interesting. And a lot of things we can say about spontaneously broken symmetry. So it's okay for charges to be finite. However, the nice thing about spontaneous symmetry breaking is that the charges are divergent. The charge is not a well-defined quantity, but the ward identity is a finite result. Like there's no divergences in the ward identity. This is why, this is why, so this is why spontaneous symmetry breaking is still very useful. It's not like everything breaks down. Ward identities are good, charges are not. So I think that's the sort of direction we need to move in. We should allow for charges to be divergent as long as the war identities are, are still finite. And this is something that people are indeed looking at and, and, and trying to study. Um, can, can I uh, ask a follow-up? Yes. Um, but the, the, the classical charge, charge is supposed to be Finite, even for spontaneous symmetry breaking. No, isn't it? No, no, no. The point is that the classical charge essentially is the in integral of J zero, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the charge density. The yeah. charge density is something you can write as a function of the fields. But now the fields have a background value, 
right? Because mm -hmm. they have a background value, the charge density has a background value. Mm -hmm. And so if I integrate it, you get infinite because I'm integrating a background constant. Okay. So the charge itself, even classically, the moment you allow fields to have background values is no longer finite. But because it's a constant, this is exactly what helps us. Because it's a constant and it's the same constant everywhere in space time, when I write down the word identity, remember word identity is a difference yeah. of two things. It's a okay. charge inserted at scry plus minus the charge inserted at scry minus. So because there's a minus sign, that divergent constant cancels out. So I get a finite war identity, but I get an infinite charge, which is totally fine. This is something that happens in physics. So uh, this is the way I do think we should deal with super rotations as well. We should think of super rotations as something that's spontaneously broken. So, and therefore they have large divergent charge, but so in order to have divergence, we have to weaken our boundary conditions, but we have to be a bit clever. We can't just weaken them freely because if we just weaken them without thinking, then the charges will be infinite and the word identity will be infinite. Nothing can be done. So we have to cleverly weaken the boundary conditions so that the charges are divergent, but the word identity is still fine. And I don't think people still understand completely what is that clever way of weakening the boundary conditions. Any more question? I mean, I, I could ask another question, but if 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 we need to stop, it, I understand. Ah, it's okay, but not more than that. This is the last one. Okay, last question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> because so, because so, this is the first time uh, QSTM seminar exceeds two and a half hours. Okay. Oh, I apologize. Um, the the super translation charge. Um, yes. in, in in gravity, it, it, is it infinite? No, no. And so it depends. It depends. So the, the, this is you know it's intermingling, right? The problem is that if you want to include super rotations in your phase space, then you have to weaken the boundary conditions. And the moment you weaken the boundary conditions, the super translation charge becomes infinite. That's why this is that's why this is so difficult. You have to be super clever that because. In the original, so suppose I don't care about super super rotations for the moment. Let's forget about super rotations. If I'm only focused on super translations, then everything is nice. Everything that I've explained over here works perfectly. You have finite charges, finite energy. You know everything is nice and finite. The charge also is totally finite, and obviously because the charge is finite, the word identity is finite. So, so now the problem becomes: I have this beautiful system set over here. Everything is working nicely. Now I want to bring in super rotations. If I try to do that, super rotations cannot be brought in for the using the boundary conditions imposed for super translations to work. By which I mean super rotations violate those boundary conditions. So in order to introduce them into our phase space, we have to weaken the boundary conditions to include them. The moment you weaken the boundary conditions, you might be able to make the super rotation charge finite but the super translation charge becomes infinite. And then if you try to weaken them a little bit more in a different direction, then the super the translation charge also becomes finite, then super rotation charge also becomes finite. So, you know, there's a huge interplay and I haven't even gone on. There's like many, many more charges. As I said, for every charge, there's a soft theorem. This is a interesting property that we have learned about these systems. For every charge, there's a soft, for every sort of symmetry of this type, there's a soft theorem. So large gauge transformations, there's leading soft gluon theorem. There's something called divergent large gauge transformations, subleading soft gluon theorem. Super, tra super translations, soft graviton theorem. Super rotations, subleading soft graviton theorem. Divergent super rotations, diver uh, sub subleading soft graviton theorems. Anyway, so there's not just two, there's many charges. And the, the reason this is such a difficult task is that we have to weaken the boundary conditions in a way such that everything holds together nicely. Charges are allowed to be infinite, that's fine, but word identities for everything have to be finite. And it's, as I said, it's a difficult task. There's a lot of interplay between many different types of charges. Like if I was doing gauge theory in a gravitational setting, like I have a gravitational background, I have gravity and gauge theory at the same time, then if I weaken my boundary conditions to include super rotations, then my large gauge charge becomes infinite. 
So everything has an interplay with itself. So it's very crucial to sort of, again, as I said, be very clever about it. And it's, uh, it's I'm sure it's possible. And I'm sure that the right person will come along and actually be able to figure it out. Yeah. Sure. No, but there's no problem with the super translation charge on its own. Everything is finite. So any more question? I hope not. I will not allow. <laughs> because he is also feeling maybe very tired. It's already two and a half mm -hmm. hour. Uh, you guys can discuss with him. It is not at all a problem. Please write to him. He just joined uh, uh, the MTP Cambridge. He's right now settling down. So you can actually write to him if you are really interested and discuss. And by the way, I will uh, post this talk uh, by today itself in YouTube. You can actually look into the channel QASTM and uh, access this talk. So thank you, Prohor, uh, for your contribution. And I, uh, I'm very happy that uh, like you have uh, like all, like shifted within two days, you have given this talk where you have no internet connection, you have managed to get everything. So it's quite, I know that like shifting is very difficult. <laughs> so I hope we will get you in this forum again with some other topic in near future. And uh, yeah, so stay safe and healthy and have a nice time at UK. And yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>